Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to today's Transport Committee meeting. Item one, apologies for absence. I've received from uh, Steve Hadzad um, and James Wright's attending on his behalf. Um, and Councillor Sykes, and Jay, I think, is coming in on, the, on his behalf. Um, Howard's not so well, so I will be sending some messages from the, the committee on, uh, on, to get well soon. And Joanne Marshall's also give her apologies. Is there any other apologies? No? Okay. I'd like to welcome today uh, operators. We've got Chris Jackson from Northern. We've got Daniel Coles from Network Rail. We've got Catherine from Tran Transpennine Express. We've got Ian from First, got Gary from Wombus, Adam and Ben from Stagecoach, Paul Turner from Transdev. No? He's over there. Yep, we got it. Uh, Chris from D&G, Alistair Nuttall from Arriva, Leslie from Nexus, Phil Stockley MCT, and Matt Rawlinson from Diamond. Have I missed anybody off? Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Cheers, John. Sorry about that. Okay. Thank you very much for your attendance. Item two, Chair's announcement. It is with sadness that I inform members of the Transport Committee the passing of Councillor Guy Harkin, a passionate and active member of the Transport Committee for many years. I'm sure you will join me in expressing our condolences to his family. Just to point out, um, Guy was the first ever chair of the Transport Committee back in the 80s. And he did a swap with uh, Joe Clark at the time uh, to become his deputy <laughs> afterwards because of his work commitments. But he has shown great passion um, for transport over the years. And I would like to ask everybody to stand for a minute's silence. Okay, thank you. So, I would also far formally like to welcome Councillor Shah Wazir back to the committee. Okay, uh, as he's the mayoral appointment to the Transport Committee, and I'd like to thank <laughs> Councillor Liam O'Rourke uh, for his service to the Transport Committee over the past few months. We wish him well in his future endeavours. Item three, declarations of interest. If anybody's got any interest, then please um, pass them all over to Nicola afterwards. We've received some already. Thank you. Item four, minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of November. Is, uh, can we approve those as a correct record? Approved. Has anybody got any matters arising from those minutes? Councillor? It's just for really for information. On page tw 12, uh, the second paragraph, uh, to address uh, residents' concerns regarding speeding vehicles, the new transport unit for GMP was due to be established. Have we, was it established in November and have we any progress on its performance? Okay. Yes, it was. Have we got any progress, Bob? Uh, with respect to traffic enforcement, they started to mount a campaign. It has been very visible on Metrolink. Um, and that good success, but in terms of traffic enforcement, you're going to see that coming through in the near future. 
Thank you. Has anybody else got any matters arising from those minutes? No. Thank you. Item 5, GM Transport Committee Work Programme. Uh, Gwyn. Thank you, Chair. Um, members will see that the work programme has been updated from the last occasion. Um, noting from the minutes, members requested uh, a number of items. Um, firstly, in relation to taxi licensing standards, uh, this is a, a district function and work is still ongoing in the, in the districts and work will be going beyond the current work programme. So at the moment, we, we can't, um, can't programme that, that for you. Um, once the work is completed, we can bring it in conjunction with work in relation to the GM Clean Air Plan. Um, Manchester Airport Transformation Plan. Um, a report will be brought to the committee um, to include surface access improvements um, to coincide, coincide with the opening of uh, Terminal 2 extension, and that will be scheduled for, for the summer. Um, and in relation to the misuse of bus lanes, you'll note that that is in your work programme for March. Okay, has anybody got any questions? John? Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions. One following on from what uh, Gwyn has just said about the taxi issue. Um, is it not possible for us to actually... Um, put some comments to the um, uh, to the districts about where we th you know, of our views on um, what changes and problems there are within the taxi licensing system, because the the trouble with waiting till after the districts have actually done their job of work is that we can't then, as a as a committee, have any uh, have any involvement in in those decisions that the districts are making. Uh, my second question was just relating to whether or not now all the, uh, notwithstanding the taxi issue, are all the other issues that were raised by members, um, are they all now on the, on a, on the agendas for this, uh, for this year? The second part of it, I think yes, because I thought I'd double checked, but hopefully everything's on. Uh, the first part of your question, I'll pass over to him. Yeah, as has been mentioned, the, the, the lead and responsibility around taxi licensing rests with the individual districts. All that we are doing is seeking to coordinate work between the, the rele relevant professional officers within the districts. If there are specific concerns that members of the committee wish to feed in, then they should feed that into their local um, uh, licensing uh, uh, teams within the individual authorities. That's the best and most direct way to make certain that your voice is being heard. Okay, has anybody got any other questions on this? No, thank you very much. <laughs> Item six, transport network performance. We've got Alex. Yeah, good morning. This is uh, November's data. Um, seems a long time ago. Now Christmas has been and gone. There is a rail and bus report later, so I will just give the headline figures, but happy to take questions. Um, seasonal average. Um, traffic was up about 2% on the road network into the regional centre, Christmas markets, uh, seasonal time. Clearly does have an impact on bus performance, which you can see in the data. Metrolink uh, was just below targets. Um, again, Appendix B in the report has, has that detail, uh, and that was a general improvement. One issue on the network uh, noted in the report was a knife incident at Abraham Moss, uh, which was dealt with by GMP. And just to note, uh, for members, uh, in December, shortly after the data cut off, there was another incident around Abraham Moss with a knife incident, and GMP are uh, fully engaged in uh, looking at that area with the new transport unit. The um, rail will be picked up later, but it was a particularly poor month in November, uh, and I uh, can see we've got operators here, and I'm sure they'll take questions later on that. There was a couple of successes. Uh, the Manchester United TFGM Trafford Borough Council engagement around the shuttle bus service and the trial and the pilot, it was good to see in November that that uh, was a success and is up and running and has continued. And one I must mention uh, was the guided busway achieved 71,626, the highest level of patronage that it's ever recorded. Uh, and the real significance is that is we can demonstrate uh, a 25% modal shift from cars uh, on the busway. But again, there is a bus uh, annual report later. Uh, happy to take any questions on the report. 
Anybody got any questions on this? Phil? Cheers, thanks, Chair. In relation to Metrolink, firstly, I'd like to thank Kate Green from TFGM, Matt Idols and Graham Lord-Jones for the engagement we've had since September and our Naval Policing Team and Youth Service for working hard to reduce antisocial behaviour on the Rochdale line. But that's actually short-lived when we come across the border into Oldham and again into Manchester because we've got major problems which no one seems to be addressing and that is with the homeless community getting on the trams with dirty blankets, taking drugs off their heads on drugs, counting the money they're earning, affecting our people coming fr from Rochdale through these areas. We really need to address these these issues instead of sweeping them under the carpet. It's all well and good that Andy Burnham's saying, let's deal with the people on the street, which he is doing, and he's doing a really good job, but we need to address these aggressive beggars which are getting on and off to trams for free and affecting people traveling to and from the city centre. Uh, thanks for the uh, acknowledgement for Kate Green and the team, uh, and, and I second that. Bob, Bob touched on this earlier around the transport unit uh, from the question and some of the impacts they've started to have on, on the Metrolink in particular. Uh, and I know there's been a significant increase in the number of um, coincidental homelessness stroke drug arrests on the Metrolink network. So I think they are starting to have an impact with the new transport unit, but certainly that's one of our feedback in terms of trying to keep that momentum going and improve that. If I could just come back, Matt. Matt. Yeah. We had a serious incident at Market Street the other day in relation to the homeless people. If that incident would have happened on the tram, then we would have had serious problems. Innocent people would have been caught up in it. We need to address this as soon as possible. We'll do that. John? Uh, the Abramosa, I mean, we raised so many times the concern when we move Woodland Road Station up to Abramosa and the drug dealing on that station and it's still going on and never stop antisocial behavior there. So really we need to point. Uh, CCTV camera is not working and the intercom is not working. You know, the help uh, intercoms on to that. None of them is working and it's not working for months now. I reported a few times that as well. Certainly I wasn't aware of that and I will take that away and look into that uh, straight after the meeting around the uh, intercom, the help points and the CCTV because that should be working. And can you get back to Naeem once it's been done? Chair, thank you. John? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, two, two questions. One uh, relating to uh, events at 2.5 on page 24. Um, evening football kickoff times. Years ago, any evening kickoff was always half past seven. These days, it's always dictated by um, TV, uh, so it can be at several diff kickoff times can be at several different times in the evening. Just wondered whether we get any opportunity to uh, to actually give some feedback about how uh, k changed kickoff times or kickoff times that get that are not decided until relatively late in the day how they impact our ability to and the operator's ability to um, to uh, ensure that services are available at the right times um, for people trying to get to these events do we actually get any opportunity to 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 input in this and the my second question was in relation to the uh, network performance scorecard um, I just wondered why in terms of buses uh, why the only greens are, we're able to, that we're able to achieve at the moment are in relation to commercial services. What makes the commercial services easier to uh, to stick to punctuality and reliability compared with the um, the subsidised services? And it'd be really interesting to get some feedback, and I think I've said this before, about services that we've changed on the subsidised network to try and improve reliability, whether or not that's actually had a positive impact because if if we change if we if we fiddle around with the services and it makes no actual difference to the reliability of a service uh, it'd be good to see that information okay I'll, I'll take the one on the football matches I'm sure Alex and Ellison will answer on the scorecard um, it is very difficult to change times we do at times get the opportunity yeah, so we have actually had some success. There was um, a recent one for United in the European match uh, where they were proposing a six o'clock kickoff. We objected strongly in conjunction with the local authorities and that did get moved back to a later start time. So we do have some impact, 
but it, it's difficult to do. Just very briefly, can it make an enormous difference just by a, a, a slightly different kickoff, whether it's 8 o'clock or 8.15 or 8 o'clock or 7.45? Because those are the sort of instances where we probably could have, could influence TV to accept a 15-minute difference, whereas it's actually probably more difficult to get a, a massive change in the kickoff time that's proposed. Given the, the capacity of the network and how it operates, the 15 minutes doesn't make any difference um, between a 7.45 and a 2,000 hours. Yeah, thank you. Um, there can be a variety of reasons why um, sort of performance can fluctuate between commercial and subsidised services. It can largely depend on the, on the service itself, on the area the service is running through. Um, the, the, the timetable that the service runs to, and that is something that we constantly do review with operators and, on, and take their feedback and, and work with to ensure that we do get the right um, timetable for the service, trying to take into account the sort of fluctuating events on the network that impact performance. In agenda item 8, the bus performance report, we have included three examples of services where we have made changes to the, to the subsidised timetable and improvements have been seen as a result of that so we can cover that again in, in item 8 in a bit more detail but there, there are examples there that we, where we, the committee have agreed changes to punctuality that have then gone on to have a positive impact and that's something that we're constantly looking to do in terms of the subsidised network. Okay, thank you. Angeliki? Thank you Chair. Um, I have a few comments with regards to rail performance. I'm not sure if I should raise them here or in the next report, but I would particularly invite comments from uh, the operators with regards to um, 2.4. Uh, it seems um, to me from uh, discussions that I had with residents, with colleagues, uh, as well as friends, uh, especially after Christmas uh, when the new, year, the, the new year actually didn't start very well, um, and actually the services, the rail services have gone worse than they were. Um, the situation with the delayed uh, and cancelled services, the short form trains, um, have deteriorated further uh, is what I am being told. Um, I am being told lots of stories about uh, people being left behind on the stations, lots of stories about uh, people not even being able to take off their jacket as soon as they get into the train, uh, people that are being ill on the train and no space for them to lie down when they actually faint. Um, I have uh, also uh, uh, been told that um, they have been denied boarding and that the situation is so bad that when a, tra a train stops in the station, uh, people are not even going out now to let people that want to go out to get out and then get back in and carry on their journeys because uh, there have been lots of times that they have actually missed the train and were not able to get back in. Uh, particularly, I mean, the stations I'm going to refer to is uh, uh, the Ryder, uh, Brow, uh, Gorton and Mosson in Manchester, but that problem is uh, across the board. Um, the other um, interesting fact that I got told by uh, one of uh, my friends that was on the train, did you know that you can fit 12 people in one of your pacer toilets? I mean, the situation is that bad that people are actually travelling inside the toilet standing. So, I would like a little bit of comment uh, with regards to, um, is, uh, 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 is, this, is this true? What are you doing about it? Um, the other thing is, uh, with regards to 2.9, uh, while the old paces are very, very unpopular, um, at least there are trains uh, going up and down the platform, therefore there are better than no trains. So, can you give us, uh, as a second part of the question, a little bit of reassurance that the old uh, train removal will not make the current intolerable situation even worse. And uh, lastly, just, just uh, so I can relay back to uh, residents and colleagues, what are the penalties that you are facing for short or cancelled trains? Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for those comments. If, if acceptable, I think maybe I could cover that in the update, in the rail section. I'll make sure I've, I've listed all your points in turn. If that... Yeah, on the rail performance report, because I think Bob's offered us a bit of time to explain our position. I think uh, I could perhaps incorporate those in that. Okay. Uh, 
thanks, Chair. There are just a couple of issues I wanted to mention, both on page 25. Um, the first one was about the, uh, the stagecoach service at, at Man United, and um, I can speak with this uh, because I, I use it regularly, uh, so, so I know how well it works. And the big problem um, before was that if you know what fans are like when they leave a football match, they tend to be running rather than walking, and they tend to barge onto buses or trains or trams rather than queue up in, a, in an orderly manner. And I've, I don't think Man United fans are any worse than any other fans. That's just how, how it is. Now, if you look at the, the tram at, at Lancashire Cricket Ground, that, that, it's controlled really well with barriers, crash barriers, and everybody, it, it works really well. Now that Stagecoach have altered things with TFGM, that's working well now because there are barriers put up and everybody's checking it. But I wanted to mention that, that when the new Metrolink line opens, uh, the, the Trafford Park line shortly, there will be a stop very close to the, the ground. In fact, that will be the nearest stop to get on a tram. And I just hope everybody's looking at the health and safety issues there because it needs to be as good as it is at the cricket ground. Otherwise, you're going to have lots of... But elderly and disabled people don't have a chance in a, in a football crowd once people start push, pushing and shoving. So you've got to try and deal with that issue. The other issue I just wanted to mention was about the busway. Now, I know we've... I always look at Doreen when I mention the, the guided busway or the Vantage service, and I know we've mentioned it many times before, but it's worth saying that because this only opened in 2016, and, it, and I think the first week of operation it had 28,000 passengers, and most of us were very relieved when it, at that level because we thought, blimey, because everybody who knew everything about everything... <laughs> were telling us it would be a failure, a white elephant, nobody would use it, nobody would leave the cars to get on it. And here we are, just over three years later, and literally, we're hitting the 70,000 passengers a week mark. Now, I don't think we appreciate the scale of that. You know, that's nearly three and a half million passenger journeys on a service that's only been in existence for three years. And the reason people are using it, the obvious reason, is they've got bus priority the whole way, or most of the way, and they, they also like the fact that the buses are, uh, are fairly new, the buses have got, you know, the, the kind of seating and the kind of um, equipment that they want on them for, you know, using iPads and mobiles and Wi-Fi and all the rest of it. But the, but the point I'm making is we don't want one success story, we want a few and I know the officers have got this in mind, but, uh, and the bus operators, but if you've got a success story on your hand, we should be replicating this elsewhere. We should be wanting to expand this service elsewhere because there are all sorts of opportunities providing ourselves have the imagination and the local authorities are, are cooperating with us. So I just hope, in this case, it's Wigan and Salford and Manchester, but irrespective of which authorities it is, we should be looking at how we can uh, deal with some of the bus issues here because it's so successful. And in terms of the percentage, it's still going up, even though the, the, the actual increase has gone down to 5%. 5% is still... A, a brilliant result at the moment. And as congestion gets worse on the roads, I can see this, but the only complaint I get now is people can't get on the buses because they fall all, you know, at, at the peak time. So apart from that one complaint, everybody thinks it's a fantastic service. And just to add to that, um, on social media, I was getting a bit of a grilling on this. Somebody being negative about it only last week. Um, we pointed out figures. The other thing I'd like to ask, Roger, if you can take back to Councillor Derek Garrido over in Salford, that obviously those statistics, I know uh, I'll ask Doreen to do that as well because we've had some fun with him over the years. Mm -hmm. the, the main thing for me, though, that if you don't mind taking back, is the fact that we're at 25% of people getting out of the cars, and I believe it all it takes one more car for us to get into that 26% bracket. So if you can ask Councillor Derigo to use the service, then we will hit 26% rather than 25. Thank you. Just, just to respond... Oh, sorry, Mark. Uh, just to respond on the um, Trafford Park line, the Wharfside stop. Uh, we, 
design that in cognizance of the lessons we've learned from Etihad and also Old Trafford. Uh, it has a particularly additionally wide platform and it has got the barriers and the corralling in place. So, so that has been uh, implemented. And I must add, uh, the shuttle bus also heavily involved Trafford Council as well in the success of that as well. It wasn't just uh, Manchester and uh, TFGM. Thank you. I've got David. Thank you, Chair. Um, I see the report addresses um, our pass, but the question I've actually got is in relation to the, uh, the concessionary pass um, and a couple of things that have been raised uh, with me. The first thing is to do with, um, to do with well, basically it's to do with the leaflet that's been sent out. And I've had a couple of people, or quite a few people actually come to me asking about the pay point shop um, um, bullet point on the leaflet. Many people are saying, what the X a pay point shop? And people don't actually know exactly you know, where, where they are or where to go or anything like that. Now, obviously, if you use pay point, you'll know, but those who uh, don't aren't really sure. So I'm, I'm just wanting to point out, really, for any future leaflets to go out, can, can that be um, far clearer? Um, and on the second thing as well, now, I've, I've already asked about this, but I want to make the point again. It's a bit frustrating that these um, passes can't be activated at, um, at local train stations. Um, I think, you know, again, for, for those who, uh, again, not really sure what our pay point shop is, um, I've got limited access to a TFGM travel shop and use the train. Obviously, that's the whole point, really, of paying the £10 to get access to the train. Um, I, I think, personally, we need, to, we need to look at as much as we can in terms of how we can get these passes activated at train stations, at the local train stations, you know, sort of the, the smaller ones, um, or even, like I say, at your more um, sort of um, major ones. But, but even so, it'd be good if that could be looked at. So, yeah, just those two points I want to raise. Thank you. Yeah, and absolutely, I'll take both of those points back, uh, and particularly around the leaflet, uh, around the pay point, if we can make that clearer for people. Yeah, we will do. Okay, Dory. Thanks, Chairman. I'm only coming in because my name was mentioned. Uh, I would like to say that we, we had one member of the Conservative group that, that fought against the Lee Guided Busway for perfectly valid reasons. He was standing <coughs> up for his constituents. Uh, I and the group as a whole fully supported the Lee Guided Busway. Uh, I'm absolutely thrilled it's a huge success and I hope that it gets pushed out further. Thanks for those comments, Doreen. I know that was hard, but thanks, thanks anyway. <coughs> right, item seven. I've got rail performance report. I've got Bob. Thank you, Chair. Uh, this report provides an update on rail performance since summer through to early December. Um, whilst during this period, the customer has uh, seen introduction of new rolling stock and increased capacity in some areas, the overall performance has declined to unacceptable levels. Um, this is a multifaceted problem. It's infrastructure failures, trespass issues, rolling stock issues, both in terms of reliability and late delivery, and also more recently train crew issues, all of which are referenced within the report. We have representatives from the rail industry today, and through the chair, I'd be happy to request a short um, update on each of those sections. Okay, anybody got any questions on that? I've got Zidra. Hi, I would like to actually add what Angeliki said. Uh, about um, performances and obviously people actually getting off the trains and using more and more cars. That's one. Um, I also wanted to ask, I know it's related to Lavin Gym Station, we still have the tunnel constantly flooding between the platforms. I know it's been going for years and years, but it hasn't been resolved. I just wonder when you guys will get your heads together and resolve this issue so people can use that. Another question is in respect of access to all and to see whether TFGM has received any response back as to why the bids to some of the stations were not successful, and also what the friends groups could do to make sure that, obviously, it still stays in radar and see how can most of the stations who need access free are able to actually get the free, uh, step free access to the stations. Okay, if somebody wants to answer that, and then I've missed a trick there, didn't I? I jumped, I jumped a little quick without actually going to the operators uh, and asking for them. But if you, somebody would like to answer, Zidris, and then I'll move on. Okay, yeah, um, thanks, Chair. Um, would you like me to update on those points in my update as well? I think that'd be... Okay. Do you want to start then, Chris? 
Thank you, Chair, and uh, good morning to members of the committee. I'm Chris Jackson, Regional Director for, for Northern. What I thought I'd do is give you a little bit of a reflection on 2019. Um, which will cover the, the period um, that, are, that are mentioned in the report. I thought I'd give you some important updates and very topical updates, particularly on Sundays, which is good news following a referendum result yesterday. Then I thought I'd go into some of the specifics that you've mentioned and take some questions at the end, if that's acceptable to you, Chair. Okay. So I think um, reflecting on 2019, it was a challenging year for us. Um, perhaps that's a little bit of an understatement, um, but we are delivering unprecedented levels of change. Um, for the industry and also for the north, um, but I'm really pleased to say that we're actually, as of today, 66%, so two-thirds of the way through our overall training programme for train crew on this side of the Pennine, so we've broken the back of the training. We'll complete the remainder of the new trains training between now and the end of the year. I think it's important to reflect on some of the challenges that we faced. Um, so we've had issues with Sundays, as, as you know, I've mentioned this at, commi at uh, committee before. Um, we have legacy terms and conditions issues with our drivers on Sundays. I'm pleased to say that after 18 months of really hard work, yesterday we got a favourable ballot result from ASLEF members, which will result in Sunday services being reinstated to the normal levels um, from next Sunday, so the 26th which is a, it's, I can't underestimate the amount of work that's gone in. That's 18 months of hard work. This is the third deal, so third time lucky. And what that does, essentially, it, um, it creates a, a, a term, a permanent term, terms and conditions change for drivers, which will um, al allow them to work amended terms of duty on Sunday. It also provides a pathway to bringing Sundays inside the working week by December 2021 or earlier. It's a really, really good news story for this part of the world because I know you've suffered so much with performance on Sundays. I think it's also worth reflecting in 2019 that um, we've had everything thrown at us. So our driver training programme had to be compressed from 18 months to nine months as a result of delays to new trains. Um, that meant that at, you know, at some points we were releasing 100 drivers per day out of the train plan to hit the requirements for our new train introduction. And that created a, a daily challenge between resourcing the train plan and delivering the train service. And that took its toll on punctuality. Um, adding to that, well-publicised congestion around central Manchester. The Castlefield corridor is operating above its design capacity. That's taken its toll. And also the late and non-delivery of major infrastructure schemes. And I, I think... Um, People get tired of me going on about this, but I think it's really important to, to reference the late or non-delivery of some, some electrification schemes is still having an impact on customers in Manchester today. So as an example, um, you mentioned some of the overcrowding and capacity. We should have, have had by now overhead wires between Manchester Victoria and Staley Bridge. We should have had overhead wires through West Horton between Bolton and Wigan. We plan to run high capacity electric trains on those routes. We can't. We're running diesel trains on those routes, which means we can't cascade those diesel trains to other routes which so desperately need it in terms of capacity. And that's an ongoing challenge that we're facing. Now, we're tackling that issue head on because we're bringing in a brand new train, a Class 769, which is a bi-mode, half electric, half diesel. We're bringing that in from March this year, but that's just plugging the gap. And I just want to re-emphasise re that point because we are still suffering, and customers are still suffering as a result of the non-delivery or late delivery of major infrastructure projects around Greater Manchester. It's also having a knock-on effect to our modifications programme because we've had to hold some units back, which is one of the reasons why we've got some units out in the business that haven't been fully modified for the PRM regulations. And that, of course, is taking its toll on unit availability as well. But I think it's worth reflecting because despite all that, um, we grew uh, passenger numbers by 8% last year. And that is booking the industry trend. We are the fastest growing TOC in the country. So it shows that despite the challenges, if you provide new trains, if you provide an, in an increase in service, we, we, you know, the, the passengers will flock to the railway industry. It's phenomenal growth. And of course, that is one of the challenges that this committee and others will have to face around Greater Manchester because um, you provide the service, people flock to it. And it won't be long before we're having conversations about we need more trains um, to, to meet that, that latent demand that's out there. In 2019 as well, we removed 52 paces. Some of them have had the wrecking ball through them. Um, some of them are going to become community hubs. And we've got 62 new trains in operation, either in passenger service or for, for training as of this morning. So it, it's a good news story. And the remainder of those will be introduced between now and May. I think it's also important to reference um, some of the projects that occasionally get lost in a little bit of the bad news. 
we've delivered some major upgrades to Wigan Springs Branch. And I'd like to invite some people around the table here to an, an opening ceremony that's going to happen in February. That's a big investment um, and new jobs, um, particularly for the Wigan area. There's a brand new shed going up at Newton Heath. We've done some platform extension works. We're the industry leader now in smart ticketing. And we maintain those strong community links as well that we're very, very proud of. Um, but, you know, for our part in the poor performance, we're really sorry and we really apologise for that. But I think it's important for the committee to, to know that the railway is just a, a, a complicated system and it only takes one part of that system to fall down and it results in poor performance. And that's why you know, I'm sure my colleagues here will say um, we're working really hard as an industry to, to improve things. So I think um, just moving on to the important updates, I touched on the ASLEF agreement that was reached yesterday. So we expect that to flow through into improved services from Sunday the 26th. It's great news. Um, the timetable change in, in December has delivered some improvements to capacity, particularly on the Bolton Corridor. There's big uplifts in capacity in the AM peak and the PM peak for the Bolton Corridor, which I know has been bursting at the seams for a while. We're running regularly now six car high capacity brand new trains between Blackpool North and Hazel Grove and Blackpool North and Manchester Airport and people are flocking to those, those trains. Um, and yeah, I think... Um, yeah, and the other point I wanted to make was um, performance has been bad, but it has really stabilised since the start of this year. So if you look at the performance stats, I guess we'll see that at a future committee. I'm really encouraged by the fact that performance has stabilised. Still much more to do, but it's been an encourage in a couple of weeks. So to, uh, I guess to answer some of the councillors' um, questions that they've raised, hopefully I've covered some of the reasons behind um, the capacity um, short, shortfalls. Um, 8% growth I, I touched on. Uh, in terms of the pacer question, yeah, it's, um, it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? So I know you mentioned about um, whether we keep pacers on for longer. I certainly have a number of emails in my inbox from user groups and pressure groups who suggest that we should keep them longer beyond the 17th of February. That's something that we're actively considering. Um, but, you know, at, at this moment in time, we haven't got any real firm plans um, but what I would say is, as a prudent operator, I've been in the industry for 18 years, it's important that we reflect on how we've performed over the last four to eight weeks. And that's one of the things that um, we're actively doing to see whether or not we can rephase some of our driver training programme to improve service resilience. And if that means we keep a handful of paces beyond the 17th of February, I think personally that's the right decision for the customer in terms of service resilience and in terms of capacity. Um, and, and that's something we're actively looking at at this moment in time. Um, and I think that's, that's my update. Catherine. Thank you, Chair. Morning, everyone. Catherine O'Brien, Customer Experience Director, TransPennine Express. So firstly, I think it's really important that I acknowledge that our performance has been unacceptable. And we know this has had a profound impact on, on customers that, that rely on us every single day and particularly in the run-up to Christmas where people are trying to get home to, to loved ones. And, and on behalf of TransPennine, I'd really like to offer a sincere apology to all members and, and certainly the communities that you represent because we do understand that this has not been where, where we want it to be. So, um, similar to Chris, we're, we're in the process of introducing new, brand new state-of-the-art trains, half a billion pounds worth of investment. I think I talked about that at the last meeting. One, one fleet of train is a mammoth task all by itself, and we find ourselves in a situation where we're actually introducing three brand new fleets of trains all at the same time, of course. You would never plan to do this, and, and this is a result of some manufacturing delays, um, primarily with our, our provider, CAF, our, our manufacturing supplier, CAF, who are, who are building two of our new fleets of trains, so um, electric trains going between Manchester and Scotland, and um, local haul trains that are running between Scarborough and Liverpool. Hitachi are, are building our... Um, 125 miles an hour, three, uh, 802 services, and they're bang on where they said they would be in terms of their delivery program. What this means is this, this is having a compound impact on driver training and conductor training, um, which essentially means that in order to get these trains into service, we've, we've got to release 
train crew from the the day-to-day -day operation to be able to learn how to to drive and, and conduct these new trains and that's that's had a, a serious impact on our performance with some of these trains nearly two years late so um You'll note in the report, and, and, and Chris has referenced it too, in the run-up to Christmas that we were plagued with, with some serious weather issues and, and that, that also um, compounded um, the delivery to customers. So what are we doing to, to stabilise that? We've, um, we've we've, we're going to replace some of our new trains with, with diesel trains and we've done that on a route between um, the airport and Newcastle to allow us to, to get the, um, the new trains through, through the manufacturing process and the maintenance programme because they, they've been delayed in the maintenance and that's because we haven't had drivers to take them back to maintenance depots. So this is hugely, hugely complex. And we've withdrawn some services between Liverpool and Scotland to, to give us some breathing space, if you will, um, to be able to, to get more drivers and conductors trained. We're about 60% way through the program um, we've got to push over the line now and, and get get the rest um, trained and, and, and ready to, to drive these trains so um, clearly we, we needed to put some mitigation in to um, make sure we kept customers moving and, and we were able to do this through ticket acceptance with other operators and kindly northern were obliging we've had some rail replacement on some routes We've had commercial agreements with, with some bus operators and we've had a, a, additional staff out at stations supporting customers with, with information. Um, in recognition of, of how bad things have been, um, this week we launched our customer compensation scheme as a genuine sorry to season ticket holders um, for the impact that, that we've had on, on um, anyone travelling. We've also issued a public apology and you might say there. They're weasel words. We want we want some action. So um, we are currently working through the reintroduction of, of the services that I've just mentioned that have been removed from the plan. Um, we want to restore the full service because you know the theme that we always talk about in these meetings is about capacity. It's about crowding on services, and we know this is a chronic problem. And I travel every single day, and it is a problem, and we know it's a problem. Um, we've got to restore customer confidence and we've got to restore trust um, because we owe it to, to the north and, and, and the north of England and the injection in capacity and the realisation of the investment is the only way we're going to cope with the growth and, and keep customers moving. So we've got to get these new trains into service and we've got a plan to do that. We're going to reintroduce um, the services in two phases during February and we've got to crack on and, and get the rest of it delivered by May. So um, we're on with that. It's, it's very high profile, as, as it should be. Um, we've been talking to the Rail Minister about this, as, as you'll, have, you'll have read in the press. So um, there is nothing more high profile than, than us getting these trains into service, and we're, we're doing that. OK, that's Daniel. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name's uh, Daniel Coles, Customer Account Manager at Network Rail. I think I know some of you, but um, for anybody that uh, I don't, um, thanks for having me here today. Um, so I think the first thing to do from a Network Rail perspective is just acknowledge some of the points that Chris uh, has made, and, and Catherine as well, um, around how we're working together going forward. I mean, um, this is a collaborative industry, and a lot of what the way that we work is to try and bring those things forward. So um, we are there to support Northern in their, and TPE, and they're bringing forward the new trains and, their infra and the infrastructure improvements needed. So um, there's been some significant changes, I think, going back to May 18 and in the sort of year and a half since then, um, implementing things like performance boards and, and things like that to tr really try and drive performance, but make sure that we're working as quickly as we can for those infrastructure improvements that are, that are needed as well. Um, I think um, looking back over the year, we've, um, there are sig you know, significant challenges. I think one of the ones that we perhaps don't talk about enough that, that Catherine mentioned was, was the weather. And I know it's easy to blame the weather, but we, we, we used to talk about once in a decade incidents. And we had a week in July where we had probably two that we'd call once in a decade incidents. So um, 
and they were flooding on the one hand and hit temperatures on the other. So those are the things we're probably going to have to think about a lot more going forward with, with climate change and things like that. Those are, those are really on Network Rail's agenda um, as well as uh, the, the, you know, the, the infrastructure, etc. Um, in terms of sort of better news, we, we had a good Christmas in terms of work. Christmas is one of our busiest periods for, for doing infrastructure improvements because obviously we get those two days where we're able to go in and, and do the work um, unimpeded. So uh, quite a significant amount of work in and around and affecting Manchester. So that was, uh, that was good news. Um, some of you may have seen the improvements at Manchester Piccadilly platform 13 and 14. I think we all know that 13 and 14 are absolutely key to everything that happens around Manchester um, in terms of, of train service. Um, so over the last year and a half, we've, we've really worked together to look at the platform and understand what, what makes it tick and what can we do to improve it. Now, we all know it's still not perfect and there's still a lot to do, but it's, it's having that um, increase in manpower, people power on the platform, but also changing the furniture to make it a much more usable platform. Um, and those are the things that will drive us forward in 2020 as well. It's those small scale improvements, whether they be app stations or in terms of our infrastructure, that then inform larger long-term, medium-term improvements. Um, I'm happy to take any questions on anything specifically um, as well. Thanks very much. Okay, so just before I bring Angie in, I, I need to raise some points with you. You mentioned, everybody's just mentioned customers, and you relate everybody as customers. But I don't know whether you fully understand the impact on those customers themselves. Because when you get individuals, as chair, never had it before, even the last two years were, you know, it's been pretty bad. Nobody has personally contacted me with their individual cases like they're doing now. And I think that's where you're seeing absolute impact. When you say people have not got a job or not the chance of getting a job because the train was delayed and their interview then didn't attend. You've got businesses where because their employees are not getting in on time, then the business is not running on time, which is costing the GM, and I'm looking at it on a GM point of view, millions of pounds in loss of earnings because of that. And then we've got businesses themselves that can't function that are losing. Not only their employees not getting in, but because they can't arrive on time to, to get contracts because they're travelling out of Greater Manchester. So how much is that affecting on employment that we could actually be gaining if, if some of our businesses could actually bid for things? And realistically, I'm asking, do you, do you care? Because when it's affecting individuals where the email is an individual, not a, just a general complaint which has happened over the years, then you know it's affecting people personally on that level. And I think if they take the time in emailing us as representatives for them on that principle, then it's our duty to take it up with you and ask you, do you care? And realistically, I know I see a lot of promises, Sunday service, I mean, a lot of people, because a lot of people work seven days a week. We've mentioned the weather, but try to explain to the general public who work seven days a week, in, in some instances, in all kinds of weather, then... How do you make that a reality to them? Well, they've still got to turn out in all the weather for themselves to do, to do the work. I don't think we're relating things. You're relating things on that level. And realistically, to get through to the general public, your customers that you say, you need to come in at a lower level so they, and explain it on that level to them how it's affecting them. And that's what I'd like to ask you today. Do you care? It hurts to hear that, actually, because for someone that, that has spent her life in, in um, delivering for, for customers, I've, I've spent 30 years um, running the railway, if, if you will, and um, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning, and I've fronted a lot recently. I've, I was out on the first day of the, the timetable. It's probably one of the worst days in my career. I don't mind admitting it, and... Um, I front lots of customers, I talk to lots of customers, I've met lots of customers over, over recent weeks, um, I manage the post bag, some of the reads are, are sombre, um, but I accept 
they want to know what we're doing about it and I think I think that's what you've got to take from today is the assurance that we do care we understand what the issues are and that's very important are they easy to fix no they're not but I think if we can um, be able to describe how we're going to, you know, restore some some faith in in the operation, which we're, we're both doing. Um, I think this is going to be, be the best thing that's ever happened for customers. But we've got to, we absolutely have to acknowledge that it has been painful, and I'm I'm hoping we are doing that today. Um, I've even. You know, I've even rang employers on behalf of, of customers to, to talk about the impact that it's, it's having on, on their arrival at work. So um, we do care. Is there a fast fix? No, there isn't. Have we stabilised the operation? Yes, we have. Um, but the, we, we've got to get this, this over the line and get these seats and these new trains in, into service. And that's what we're, we're heads down doing. Um. Thanks, Chair. I think you're right. You, your comments are quite sobering. Um, I read our Twitter feed on, on, a, regular, on a regular basis, a daily basis. Um, we note that our complaints have, have risen. We've seen the Northern resist protests. So we're acutely aware of the sentiment that's out there, and we're acutely aware of the impact that we're having on the wider, greater Manchester economy as an industry. And I think just to, to emphasise some of the things that Catherine has said, you know, in my 18 years, this is, this is probably the, the most turbulent time that I've seen, certainly many of the people that work for me have seen it's been a really tough time. But you know what keeps me motivated in the morning, despite the noise around Director Ward, OLR, myself and the team were just relentlessly focused on delivering the plan because we know the plan in 2020 absolutely comes together. It delivers improvements in capacity, delivers improvements in train service, the old trains go, and customers will see the transformation happen in 2020. I guess what I would say is, We've never said that the transformation was going to be easy, and we fully recognise there's been a number of bumps in the road, but there is a real solid plan to deliver improvements in 2020. And all I just ask is that customers bear with us. And to answer your, your key question, do we care? Absolutely, we care. Um, I, I don't think I can say any more than that. Uh I think from a Network Rail perspective, in the past, it might have been quite easy for us to say, well, the customers belong to Northern and TPE, and th you know, they're our customers, so, that, so be it. But absolutely, that is not the case anymore. Um, I think it's really, really drilled into, our, into everybody within our organisation how important and how, how affecting even the simplest a decision can be to the travelling public. So we've got a, a, a real emphasis at the moment on things like, do our signalers understand when they make a decision how that affects customers? And that's something that we, we need to do more and more of, and we're working with, with Northern and TP and the other operators to do that, sharing you know, information to make sure that everyone is aware of what they, they actually do and how that impacts people. So um, for us to say, do we care? I think we, we really do. And uh, as a, at a national level for Network Rail, we're a huge organization. One of the things that's leading us is this idea of putting passengers first. So in the past, we might have talked about larger infrastructure improvements without really thinking about the output for, for passengers. But I don't think that's the case anymore. And every decision we're making is based around this idea of how do we make sure the passengers are the first in everybody's mind. And that's, so that's built into project management, that's built into decision making, that's built into everything that we do throughout the business now, I think. Okay, I'll bring in Angie. Thank you, Chair. Um, first question to Northern. I've got one for all questions for all three of you. Um, I live further up the line than Ryder Brow, Romilly, um, and I echo everything that that you said. Um, it's been absolutely dreadful this last two years. Um, I'm pleased to hear about the ballot yesterday. Um, I look forward to us finally getting some trains again on Sundays because our line seems to be the first one where services have been pulled on a Sunday. And I also hope that it might, it might encourage TFGM to think about a Sunday service on the Rose Hill line. Um, it's a very important line for leisure services. You, you get straight onto the Middlewood Way. We're trying to encourage people to get out on the bikes and walk. That would be a really... The fact that it's got no Sunday service means that families can't go out there on a Sunday afternoon. Um, infrastructure stations. Um, 
you were saying about Levensium Station. Well, Romilly also has problems, huge problems with water ingress. We get promises year on year that something's got to be done. And guess what? As I walked up the steps at the station today, I was practically wading through puddles to get to the plat platform. It's not good enough. And uh, so, yeah, we need improvements in capacity, in rolling stock. We need to stop these stories where people can't get on the train. I mean, my own family have been involved in that, where they can't get on a train. Um, our line is particularly bad for skip stopping, particularly the train down from Sheffield. Um, I've been a victim of that myself. Um, hopefully that's enough air battering for Northern. Trans Pennine, yes, you're absolutely right. Your service has been unacceptable. I'm a regular traveller up to Scotland by rail. It's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, and, and it's got so bad that if the, train, the Glasgow to Manchester train is cancelled, that it was Virgin, I don't know what the agreement is with Avanti now, but Virgin was stopping honouring the tickets. They were fed up of taking the slack for TPE for what they saw as mismanagement. And, um, and like you were saying, the capacity on the trains... It, they're just so full, it's really uncomfortable. And in fact, it's got so bad that if I'm leaving Scotland to come home and I've got a commitment that evening, I'll go the day before to make sure that I'm home for the meeting. It's that bad. Network Rail, what on earth is going on with the overhead lines north of Preston? They were down again yesterday. And again, this with traveling up to Scotland, that's thousands and thousands of people severely delayed. Is it... I mean, is it poor maintenance of the overhead lines or what? They never used to be this bad. I'll take that one first, if that's okay. It, it is a big issue. I think um, yesterday we was, it was going on until five o'clock this morning, so it was, it was almost 24 hours that that, that affected us for. Um, one of the things that we're working on in terms of the overhead lines, and particularly that area seems to be hit, we think it's because of, of winds and wind speeds and things like that initially, but also we're looking at the quality of steel that we use. The designs for some of these uh, overhead lines are, are quite old, so we, we're, we're looking at a refresh for some of those. But it is a case of um, constant maintenance for these, and unfortunately we've been hit a couple of times over the last few months which have really affected the service. So sincere apologies for that. And while we do get in, as, and we were in quite quickly yesterday in the morning to actually get there, but it still didn't mean that we were able to fix it until that, until the overnight so uh, sincere apologies for that okay um if i may yeah thank you uh, for your comments um a couple of things firstly in relation to stations i didn't answer the levenshume station uh, question earlier but I will, I will take that away we'll come back to you and um, with my colleague with network rail we'll do the same with romilly um thank you for bearing with us is what is what i would say there is some really good news coming this year for customers on the rose hill and also the line of route towards sheffield because you will see new trains coming uh, later point this year so we'll be doing some new launch events and we're happy to get you involved in that so I think that hopefully is some recompense for what um, what you've suffered in in, in recent months uh, but that's happening in 2020 I'm sorry to hear you've had such a difficult time on on our anglo Scottish route um, it is quite concentrated the, the issues there so Preston and Glasgow depots that serve the route are probably the least progressed in terms of their, their training plans. That, that in addition to the trains that you're gonna you see on that line, the new electric trains, the 397 trains, we've only got two of those in service, so access to, to training on those is, is very limited. But um, recognize what you're saying in terms of you know, keeping customers moving, and obviously there's, there's all kinds of commercial issues with, with various tickets. The challenge we had before Christmas with Avanti, and we are all not one family now, so you would expect it to be much easier, was that their trains were so heavily crowded on, on lots of days in the run-up to Christmas, um, essentially, that, that they were saying, listen, we're, we're full anyway, we can't take any more of your customers, and then, and then you're unfortunately resorting to a bus. Post-Christmas, that, that's been a better arrangement. I hope you're going to tell me it has, because um, certainly this week, we've, we've had some disruption this week on that line, um, which, which we're we've caused ourselves we've we have managed to get some ticket acceptance with avanti so i'm hoping that that can um that can continue and, and we'll keep you moving on your journey but but is a little bit of a pinch point for us that route so just it's important i've, I've been honest with you but I'm, I'm really sorry john 
Thank you, Chair. My question to Northern was actually answered by Chris's um, opening <laughs> comments, but just a question to uh, Network Rail, and that was in relation, you made some comments about platform 13 and 14. I just wondered where we were with um, discussions about the potential for platform 15 and 16, or whether that's just disappeared. So I think I think the discussion from a network rail perspective, you may have seen our system operator um, report that was issued in the back end of last year, around about September, October, which gave recommendations for um, sort of a network rails recommendations, if you like, for what should happen between Deansgate and Piccadilly, essentially. Um, within there, there was a number of suggestions. Um, we, I think it was discussed quite significantly at the Rail North Board last, last week in terms of that, but from our perspective, um, it's still, we're waiting for further comment, really. Okay, I've got Nathan. Thank you, Chair. Um, a few points for, for, dif for different people. I'll give you all the points, then maybe you can pick up on them. I'll start with where I fundamentally think it all starts, which is with uh, Network Rail, although this is very specific, but I suspect common across the whole of GM. Um, we've known that this uh, access uh, issue, i.e. access to platforms for disabled, has been coming. We've known for probably years. Um, yet the improvements at Hale Station, I could have physically built something better myself. It's scaffolding, it's, it's ugly. So we've got an iconic station in a beautiful village and it's a pig's ear, the access that has been put together. So, uh, and I guess that could be common everywhere. That just, we know it's coming. So how can we get it wrong? We leave it too late. So then mo just moving on uh, to Chris, but it also affects uh, TP as well. Um, an increase in sickness uh, to 1,700 incidences, a 30% increase in that period, um, seems disproportionate. Uh, I don't see anything in the TP report that says they had an increase. Is it something specific to Northern, in which case is it, is it people being constructively sick in order to make Northern look even worse? So I'd like that addressing. Um, going to the pace that's being held back, I certainly would support that. I think passengers would rather have a train of any sort um, rather than no train, so that, that is definitely, a, and the same with the diesels with respect to TP, anything is better than nothing. But again, about similar to the network rail, uh, TP invested, was it a billion? Half a bit, half a billion, so we're investing half a billion. I've also just heard Christmas mentioned. So we're investing such massive amounts of money, and the overhead cables have not gone in so we're having to run diesel so the whole thing is behind yet we're at the last minute trying to train our drivers the level of planning there relative to finding half a billion pounds and then designing a train and saying we're having that to be late training the drivers seems a level of incompetence you know if i was buying a new car i would know to insure it and get that insurance ready and this and it's it's basically and then again an excuse of christmas we've known for what two thousand years that christmas is coming <laughs> we just know these things so far in advance how can we get it wrong um so i'm not really annoyed about those it's just it seems so fundamental as from all three areas and we'd like to address those if you could. Thank you for the points. Um, Christmas is relevant because we see a massive drop off in availability o over the Christmas period. People want to be at home with the families and, and it is, it, it's always a bit of a pinch point. We haven't necessarily seen the same levels of sickness. We, we, we've seen spikes at individual depots, leaves always higher and available I, availability to work rest days just drops off a cliff because people don't want to be at work when it's Christmas. Um, the issue with training drivers has been um, the delay in the manufacturing process and therefore the de delay in access to brand new trains. So whilst 
you know, we would have been training drivers two years ago, 18 months ago on new trains. We haven't had those new trains in the UK to be able to, to train drivers and they need physical access to these trains. It takes 20 days to train one driver alone on one train. So, so that's the scale of the task, if you will. Um, but we can't do it in simulation or in a textbook. It, they've, they've got to physically handle the train, put so many hours driving the train, be instructed on the train. These are, these are you know, 125 miles an hour trains. Some of these are brand new um, trainee drivers. So, so you've got to get that right. And it takes a long time and it's complicated, but you would never choose to do it now, but it's just the compound effect of the delay in, in the trains arriving in the UK. If I may chair. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your comments in relation to Hale. I'll investigate that both internally and with Network Rail to see about that. We'll get you a response after the meeting. Um, I guess similar to what uh, Catherine's mentioned, we, we are delivering at Northern the biggest single training program in UK Rail. Um, and I, you know that, that um, suggestion about our poor planning has been levelled at me uh, a number of times. So I, I appreciate why the question's been asked. Um, but I'd just like to, to give as much comfort as I can. Um, no one in their right mind would have planned to have trained the volume of drivers and conductors. So that's over 11,000 training days just for depots this side of the Pennines in 2019. 11,000 days. No one in their right mind would ever have planned to have done that in a nine month period. We had to do that to make sure that we release the majority of the paces by the end of the year, but also um, to, to enable the new trains to enter service to transform travel. So that delay in manufacturing, compressing the driver training program has had a massive effect. Actually, for, for Christmas, we chose to pause our training program because we knew that there were going to be some challenges around availability. But unfortunately, the, fact, the benefits that we got from that were taken away by the uplift in, in sickness that you referred to. And it was a 30% uplift in driver sickness year on year. Uh, and it was sickness, <coughs> vomiting, diarrhea. I don't think, to answer your question, there was anything in there that was constructive um, in, in that sense. Um, so, um, you know, we, we started to see improvements in terms of availability at the start of this year, and we're seeing that through our performance figures. Um, and what to mention, yeah, and as I touched on, I think it's important to emphasize we've broken the back of the training now. 66% um, has been complete on this side of the Pennines. We've got a, a third to do, and we're well on track to deliver that between now and May, when all the paces would have gone. Okay. Just, just to come in on that, and I've mentioned it here before, that is phase three, isn't it? So, so when, when I saw the initial plans through TFN, that was phase one and phase two were supposed to, phase one was supposed to be started, what, 2017? So, so what I'm saying is phase one and phase two have been put back anywhere. So have they, they've still not been delivered. I know you're saying not delivered, but what I'm saying is this was phase three, which supposed to have started 2018. One and two, phase one and two hadn't, has not taken place, has it yet? Sorry, Chair, I'm not sure what phases you're referring to. Infrastructure phases, training phases, or in introduction phases? New, new train phases. So, realistically, we, we had phase one, phase two. I think phase one's supposed to have started in 2017. Yeah. So, I, I think, um, for, from memory, Chair, I can't remember specifically what the phases we, we're talking about, but I think, um, ju just to re-emphasise the point, and hopefully this um, answers your question, really, the new trains are, are late. And that's driven this compression in the, uh, in the training program. And that's why we've experienced some of the availability and associated punctuality and reliability issues over the last few months. More than happy to talk uh, about it um, specifically after, after the meeting, just so I understand exactly what, what phases you're referring to. Okay. I've got Phil. Thanks, Chair. Chris, it's good that you come to the meetings. I look forward to you to you come into the meetings because if nothing else we always get a good news stories full of pro broken promises from yourselves over many years we've been told everything will happen this is going to happen you've done all the singing and dancing in the meetings when we walk outside the building it's back to being completely chaotic on the trains in relation to trans pennine you need to start admitting to yourself that it's your responsibility a bit, your responsibility, your fault that these issues have occurred. It's not the manufacturers. It's easy for a workman to blame his own tools, but it's down to yourselves. You needed to program the trains coming in 
when you wanted to, them to come in. It's unacceptable that you keep passing the buck onto other people. Take some responsibility and admit to people we've made a mistake here. Also, can you tell me how many people has, have applied for the compensation since you launched it in December? Okay, so hopefully I've been brutally honest today in terms of acknowledging the pain. Yes, of course, it's, it's our role to manage our manufacturers and only yesterday CAF were in front of the Rail Minister having to explain their part in this because we can't get away from the fact those trains are delayed and, and, and the build has been delayed. So, so they have got a part to play in this. But yes, it's our role to, to, to hold them to account, if you will, and, and they're firmly being done that at, at the highest level. The compensation opened on Monday. As of last night, when I went home, there was just short of a thousand people had applied for compensation. So um, we're expecting um, a few more over the next few days as it as it gathers a bit of traction. But but there's been a good take up in the first few days. Just to ask you on that, that, that is just season ticket holders, isn't it? Because the complaints that I've been getting is if you could tail the service, that, so that person has bought a day ticket. They can tell the service, then they buy in and they have to buy another ticket to get on somebody else's service to go to go in further. Who's compensating them? Yeah, so so the delay repay um, process exists for, for those people and anyone that's had to buy a new ticket that's that's as a result of us can can apply for a refund. Th those channels are available now. Um, there's some good news in that We've got delay repay 30 at the moment, and we're, we're shortly going to be introducing delay repay 15, which, which will bring um, another further benefit to customers and, and their ability to, to be able to claim back. Can you share the link to where people look for compensation to me, please, and I can spread it out through all the members? Of course, of the course, Councillor, yeah. And that goes for everybody, if you don't mind. Thank you. I've been patiently stewing here. Uh, okay, um, so um, you, you talk about the progress and you talk about the good news, but I'm telling you that your customers are absolutely not feeling it. They're seeing a faceless organization that is unsympathetic to everything that they're going through on their daily commute, and this has got to change. They've seen increased fares, and they have seen no change. So. You have not answered the question with regards to the penalties that you are getting um, for shorter trains or, um, or delayed, um, or shorter or cancelled trains. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask is when do you think uh, your customers are going to start feeling the benefits of the ballots uh, about Sunday services? And uh, again, lastly, um, can you please be frank and honest uh, in your response? Um, as your customers are paying the price for your planning, um, can you give us any reassurance, as much as it's written, uh, is worth the, pa the paper that is going to be written on, um, that the old train replacement is not going to make the situation worse, that you have learned the lessons, that the plans that you have are realistic and deliverable, that you have contingency things in pl um, packages in place, um, that your staffing issues will be ironed out well in advance. Thank you um, for the questions, um, if I may, Chair. Um, okay, so I think um, in terms of customers, we're eagerly awaiting the um, National Rail Passenger Survey results. They're due at the end of this month. Um, so I think... Um, you, well, as we always do, we act on those results, um, but we're eagerly awaiting those. And that, I think that will reflect perhaps some of the, the sentiment. Um, but we, we're not deaf to what our customers are saying, hopefully, and I artic articulated that a little bit earlier. Um, you're right, our fares did increase 2.48%, um, so below RPI. Um, you know, we've, we've frozen a number of our advanced purchase fares. We, we sold 300,000 tickets at 10 pence. Um, which was a phenomenal success once again. Um, and of course, um, we, we're always looking at where we can um, provide additional value uh, to, to customers in, in that sense. 
Um, in, in terms of penalties, there's a well-established penalty regime for, for the industry in terms of when we cancel services in particular. Um, and also we're subject to monitoring regularly by the Rail North Partnership Board in terms of our performance. But in particular for, for cancellations, there is a very strict um, penalty regime in place. It's called Schedule 8. Um, it's, it's enshrined within, with a number of, um, within our um, access contracts. So I can give you some comfort that we are, we are very much feeling the pain um, financially for what the customers are feeling out on the ground. Hopefully that gives you some, some comfort. In terms of Sundays, um, Sundays will get better from the 26th. Bearing in mind the result came through late yesterday. Our rostering processes require a number of days to get that up and running within the, the confines of our agreement, so we will see improvements from next Sunday. Um, in terms of our um, train replacement plans, we only have dispensation to keep paces um, until May. Um, 31st of May, and that's been signed by the Department for Transport. So they have to go by, by May. I don't propose keeping um, the handful any longer than, than we need to, but I'm cognizant of some of the comments that have been made today in relation to providing resilience and capacity. That is top, top of my list, really, to make sure that we're providing a, a reliable service for our, for our customers. In terms of contingency and staffing, I, th I just want to bust a little bit of a myth. We, we absolutely have enough drivers and conductors to operate our service. And we've got about 1,800 drivers on the books. I've got 207 drivers in various stages of, of training. Um, we absolutely have enough drivers and conductors to operate our service. What I mentioned earlier was it was just very difficult for us to plan for that significant compress in training um, because of the new trains um, delays. That's what's caused some of the issues in, in 2019. But I want to give you some comfort that we've got solid plans in place between now and May to introduce the remainder of our new trains and to get rid of those paces. Hopefully that answers your question. Thanks, Chair. Uh, it's a question regarding Flurry Field to uh, both Chris and Network Rail. You've, you've put two ticket machines on the platform and withdrawn them through vandalism. I had a meeting well over 12 months ago with one of your officers when Raj was away on other duties and a senior like superintendent from the local police force and we suggested that you yeah. relocate the machine on, onto the pavement where it's in public you've got cctv on the platforms but no cameras that actually watch the ticket machine now, our engineers have found a location where they think it'd be suitable, but you never came back. So if, if you could look into that for me. I think currently um, you are doing some work on, on the platform, erecting fencing. Now, earlier on this week, um, councillors in Hyde uh, launched a pick up a piece of litter Hyde. every some day machines and go. campaign. The Great Britain Spring Clean annual event starts later in the year. But whoever is responsible for the railings, the staff are putting the old railings and some of the new metal ones on the embankment. And it's a big problem in Newton Station, rubbish on the embankment. I know it's very steep and difficult to, to clean. Um, but we, we did have a group of scouts at one time that were <coughs> keen to take over and look after the station, but the blackberries that grow there, they're that thick. So it's too dangerous. I mean, with these, I mean, these railings are eight foot high. I mean, I'm not sure why we need eight foot high railings on the platform. Thanks for the question, Councillor Robinson. Um, what I will do is I'll have a chat with our maintenance team who cover the local area and ask them to do a, a bit of a clean-up through uh, Newton for Hyde. It may be in a plan to do, but I'll ask them to, to raise that. And I'll, and I'll get some details of the project for you as well um, in terms of the railings as well, just to explain what we're doing and, and why. If anybody's got any, like, personal point of view on any individual station. I think if, if I'll ask Linda afterwards 
to make sure we email everybody's email address out so they can take that, you know, outside of the meeting point of view. I don't want to get involved in the meeting with all personal thing on an individual station point of view. Okay. Um, but if somebody can pick that up with Peter afterwards. I have a couple more people. I've got Roy first. It's based on some personal experience, but it's not a personal issue. It's a general one. And it's about joint ticketing. And, I mean, there's lots more I could say because I use trains nearly every day. Uh, but I'm, I'm going to keep it brief. Manchester Sheffield line was brought up by the new MP for High Peak, the Hope Valley, in Parliament yesterday and tried to get some answers on it. And we've, uh, it's been raised here before about the platforms not being long enough so we can't have more carriages. <clears throat> I hope um, that's been looked at. But recently went to get on TP train, bought a ticket to go to Sheffield, as I do often. And I should have known this, but I didn't. We couldn't get on. We literally couldn't get on the train at Piccadilly. So we tried the East Midlands, and we couldn't get on that either. So we went on the stopping train, the good old pacer, with a happy group of people, walkers, and we eventually got there. But they said, your ticket doesn't apply because you bought a TPE ticket. Now, it's only a one-hour journey between two of the greatest cities in the country, and you can't just go up and buy a ticket. You have to say which company you're going on. Well, if you can't get on that company's train, so you go on the next one, you've got to pay more. Now, they gave me a form to claim, but I never did. I couldn't. It wasn't big enough to claim. So, can we get joint ticket in there? And because it'll be the first and last time I speak today with all the demand on this, buses as well... We have a 98 and a 71, two different companies, Go North, Western Diamond. I wouldn't have realised this with my pensioner's card. And my son was up um, at Christmas. He bought a weekly ticket, went to town on one bus. They wouldn't take it on the other. They've now decided to have two separate day tickets to do the same short route in the same town. I think they've got to get together and do something about this or Andy Burnham might have to put in his franchising rules. Thank you. We'll, we'll take that second one yes. in the uh, bus performance report, which is next, if we don't mind. You, can you clock that, Alison, please? Okay, um, I've got David. Thank you, Chair. Um, it is related to a station, but it links into the wider network, so I'm not going to wax lyrical about little things. Um, I just wanted to say, first of all, actually, I'm going to be somewhat positive here. I was very um, pleased to see um, Network Rail and Avanti work together to sort out one of the lifts at um, Stockport Station. Um, you know, it was going to take four months, I believe, at one point, but you did seem to work together after a bit of pressure to get that sorted, so I was very thankful for that. However, what it does link into the fact that Stockport Station needs a lot of investment, um, and certainly in terms of the wider network, um, the impact that it's having, I believe, further down the line as well, in terms of obviously, you know, when we're talking about platform, you know, platforms 15 and 16 at Manchester Piccadilly, my understanding is if that work doesn't happen further up the line near Stockport, the, the two platforms are going to be pointless because you're still going to have issues with capacity. So what I'd like to know is what are you all doing together um, in terms of getting that investment that we need at Stockport Station and on that line in order to improve capacity and then for it to benefit the wider network? Um, because, frankly, I, I, sometimes what, what gets me a bit frustrated is the fact that it's very difficult at times to see what, working is, what work's going on behind the scenes between you all. So I'm very keen to, to hear what work you are all doing together to try and support what we need um, at Stockport Station on that line and to then improve capacity across the network locally. Hi, thank you. I think that's a really valid question. Recently, I presented to the Mid-Cheshire line at a public forum in, in Nutsford. And of course, one of the reasons why we can't support the second training hour is because of capacity issues around Edgeley and um, Stockport. Um, it's, it's a big issue. I touched on it. Greater Manchester capacity, the railway network is uh, working above its design capacity and that's suppressing punctuality and suppressing reliability. And that's why certainly uh, from a northern perspective, I'm sure it'll be echoed by colleagues, we welcome any investment in infrastructure around Greater Manchester. I think perhaps there's a feeling that it has gone a little bit quiet recently, but I do know that there's a lot of work going on, particularly TFGM, particularly at, at Transport for the North, looking at investment options, unlocking that that capacity and what's needed because if you do something as you say at Piccadilly you will have to do something uh, at Stockport end as well I really look forward to seeing those proposals and I think I don't know whether Bob will be able to update any further on that 
Yeah, I think it's fair to say that between TFN and Network Rail, um, it's number one priority. Uh, and this week, myself and Simon met with Tim Shoveler, uh, Route Director for the North West, London North West, and we are making attempts to move the resignaling of Stockport way up the agenda. I'll take one, last one, Dory. Cheer you up now. You always do. <laughs> uh, it's on page 56. It's the community rail. Uh, when, I, when, I, um, when we started the Rail and Metrolink Committee, I, I was the first chair, and at that time, Darren Kirkman was uh, my officer, if you like. Um, and we looked at rail and everything else and, and thought, this community, community rail, what do they do, what, blah, blah, blah. So we, we went into it and I said, I think we should have one day a year where we have them in, where they can network between each other and, and we can thank them for what they do. Now, I'm, I'm going back many moons, but since then it's happened every year. And I can't believe the work that these people do voluntary. Mm. We've now got to the stage where they bring schools in, they do murals, they've got libraries, uh, they've got art galleries, and, and it's, it's unbelievable what they do. But I also want to just say now to the committee that Mark Andalusi runs these events for me now, he sets them up, uh, but he puts a lot of his own personal time in. Uh, and I, I just admire what he does, so I, I just want to say thank you to him, to this committee. Acknowledged, and yes, you've cheered us all up. <laughs> okay, so moving on, item eight, bus performance report. Sorry. <laughs> I've passed a resolution that Greater Manchester have their own award for community rail users groups. And it's years ago since we passed it, but we still don't see it on the, on the stations. Bus service performance report. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. This is uh, an update report focusing on bus performance. Uh, it covers performance of the bus network between December 2018 and November 2019, with a focus on the subsidised network. The trends we've seen in performance um, have continued from the last time um, a report was uh, provided to this committee, where we're seeing um, generally an improving trend in terms of reliability, but there have been some uh, declines in terms of punctuality. We can note, however, that punctuality is above the national target. <coughs> Um, punctuality is above the national target set by the Traffic Commissioner that we, um, we also monitor against. Um, in terms of the subsidised network, uh, lost mileage on subsidised contracts was at, stood at 0.36%, which is beneath the industry standard of 0.5%, and operational performance was also positive in the period overall. We've, we've also continued to see um, a, num a decreasing number of comments about subsidised bus services, indicating um, a positive trend there too. In section four, as I mentioned earlier, we've included some information about the impact of changes that the committee improves. So where um, the committee has improved changes to timetables of su subsidised services to improve punctuality, we've given three examples where that has then had a positive impact. And as I mentioned earlier, that's something that we are very keen to do in terms of um, ensuring the timetables provide a, a, a positive um, performance uh, level. Um, we've already mentioned earlier in the meeting about the success of the busway and the report includes some more information than in the previous report um, about uh, patronage growth and the continuing trend that we see in that regard and leading to the record level that we saw at the beginning of December of over 70,000 pa uh, passengers per week on the service. Um, and finally, we have got informi some information about our pass. Again, we touched on it earlier in the meeting, but just to confirm that we now have um, over 37,000 passes out on the network with over 50,000 journeys per day being made using those passes. We've got a number of um, operators here today who I'm sure will also be um, happy to answer any questions along with myself uh, that members have got on the report. So have you got an answer? Sorry, to... yeah, of course. Um, so in terms of the ticketing um, arrangement, um, pre prior to um, the end of last year, 
there was an arrangement between First, Go North West and Diamond where the tickets were interoperable across each other's services. That was um, an arrangement that the operators put in place following um, the sale of the former First depots to Go North West and Diamond. That arrangement ceased at the end of December. I don't know if either of the operators would like to comment on that, but that is the reason why um, you're now seeing that, that um, ticket um, not, no longer being interoperable. Comment? Yep. Yeah, I'll, I'll pick up on that. Um, I think we talked about the last meeting which I attended um, and, and there is a System 1 product that's been around for a long, long time that, that allows for that inter interchangeability so you can use a stagecoach and use First, Diamond and, and, and Go North West. So I think that would be the product that, that people should be going towards now where there's a, a mixture of, of operators on a set corridor. Okay, anybody else got any questions? John? Uh, just two points, Chair. Um, first of all, in, in relation to the uh, 1.4 in the introduction about the, um, uh, the satisfaction levels th from the uh, focus survey, uh, whether or not we have um, details broken down between commercial and subsidised services on the satisfaction rates. And secondly, just, bringing, just returning to the point that I made in the previous overall performance, the, the information that we've got in this report is in a different format to the, um, to the stats from the previous report. It would just be helpful to actually be able to see how we're doing on all the services that we make changes to on the subsidised network, because obviously that's one of the few things where we actually make the decisions. So having the full stats to see how uh, the changes have actually made a difference, because obviously, yes, they've made a difference on the particular services that, we're, that, that are referred to here, but I think we should actually get the stats on all the service changes to see whether or not the decisions that we're making are actually the right decisions. OK, feed that back, yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly. We'll look at what um, what more we can do in that in that in terms of your, your latter point. Um, around the passenger focus survey, um, it's the sample size is generally not not sort of um, a huge one, um, so it's not easy necessarily to split it down in terms of commercial and subsidised services. It's run by Transport Focus. They generally do um, look at um, you know just passengers experience um, and to the passenger it's not necessarily a um, major concern to them whether it's a commercial service or a subsidised service it's the um, experience that they have on that on that service um, I think we have got in the work program a um, future presentation by transport focus on uh, the, the transport surveys um, but uh, it isn't easy to break it down to that level um, so I, I, I think I can't, I can't say we can do that, but we'll have a look at what other methods of um, kind of understanding customer satisfaction we, we have and that we could present. I will see what passenger yeah. focus. Uh, but Nathan? Uh, thank you, Chair. Re referring to our pass, um, and actually, this is, it's an interesting point between committees how, how, how they, they don't join. So, in, on a previous committee that I sat, um, so the R Pass have got 37,000 holders. As, as I understand it, the cost of R Pass was 15 million. Um, I'm sure somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. So, so that gives us a cost per user of £400 to the, the Great Manchester taxpayer. Um, and at the point that I spoke to the Mayor about this, which was probably about six, maybe nine months ago, the Mayor hadn't formulated what success or failure meant for our pass because this is a two-year pilot. Um, so is 37,000 users at a cost of £400 a success? Or is it on... on so is it on a trajectory for success and it's likely to be continued or is it on a trajectory to failure and will that 15 million be have to be picked up by the taxpayer ongoing beyond the two years or is this not the correct forum um, I think the, um, the take up of the the pass uh, would be deemed to be a success um, and, and certainly it is within the numbers that we'd forecast and budgeted for. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, detailed discussion that the Mayor has had around metrics, uh, but I'll certainly ensure that the report's brought back to a future committee. Okay, Sean? 
Um, this is just a bit of a general feedback on first uh, complaints and comments mechanism. Um, I've had a few approaches from people that, that I represent around when they have submitted things via the form online or whatever it is that you usually do to make a complaint or comment about a first service. They've got an initial acknowledgement or something re re replying to them saying, oh yeah, thanks for letting us know, that's nice. And then they kind of don't get any, anything further after that or there are examples, I've got examples of where that has not happened. So I don't know where these uh, comment forms go. Uh, when you submit something on the website and whether there just needs to be a rethink about how you accept feedback uh, in terms of your services. And, and I kind of hate to do it here because it's, it's not really the place, but the specific things that people have raised with me uh, where they've got the, oh yeah, that's nice, thanks for letting us know, is the popularity of the X84 service on Man uh, Oldham Road is frequently a single deck um, and so by the time it gets down to Failsworth, people can't get on. Uh, somebody reported that via the website and said, um, yeah, the bus isn't big enough and they just got a kind of thanks for letting us know sort of thing. And the other thing is that a personal experience, um, you've changed the numbering of the 184 to the 84, but sometimes the destination displays still say 184 when they're making their way down to Manchester beyond Oldham, or they have been seen to be doing that. Um, so I think there's just a bit of training required of drivers, or maybe if you can just make it so it's impossible to program it to say 184 to Manchester, so that can't happen again, because I know there are passengers that are not putting their hand out for buses, assuming that they don't stop uh, there anymore because they're not on the, on the uh, stop. So I'll never do that again, um, and re <laughs> but it's just that complaints and feedback procedure. I just think it needs looking at so people know who the part of contact is that's appropriate. Thank you, Chair. Um, by coincidence, um, we've had a, a few complaints, and there's, it, is a, it is a shared service in Leeds that deals with it, <coughs> and it's, it's a shared service between different first companies, and myself and a few of the, the other MDs were not happy with the service that was being provided and I attended a meeting in London on Tuesday with the director of the Shared Service Centre and his customer care lead and there's a lot of uh, improvements being put in place because we recognise it's not done what it, it needed to do. The, the, the comments that come back, um, the response that goes back to the customer might not always be wholesome but certainly the comments about the capacity on the X84 just like on Vantage or anything else, it does get back to us even if they're not or a bit clunky in terms of how they're responding back to the customer. I apologise for that, but we are getting the information and, and, and addressing whatever needs addressing. So I just want to check, you will feed back to Sean on that, <laughs> on that other issue rather than wait for another inquiry afterwards. So. <laughs> right, OK. Phil? Thanks, Chair. Can I thank Ed asking to thank Brendan for the work he's been doing over in Lickleborough and North Yorkshire in relation to the bus services. It's good to have a partnership working with Brendan to try and resolve the issues over that way. Okay, thank you very much. Item nine, forthcoming changes to the bus network. Is it Alison who's taking this or? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Chair. If I may, a familiar report so we'll go straight into Annex A. Any comments and questions on changes to the bus network made by the commercial operators? So straight into this for comments and questions, please, Chair. Okay, no. Thank you, Chair. It's regarding the 150 service that Stagecoach operate, they've, uh, because of roadworks, they they've announced that they are going to cancel the journey from Hyde to the Trafford Centre and it's now going to terminate in Gorton. Now there's other buses running on, on that route that are going to be affected by roadworks but my question really is, last week I think some time ago there was a, a meeting with officers from Thameside Council and Stagecoach and Stagecoach have refused to acknowledge that when the road works are finished, the route will, will be reinstated. So I'm asking them here today, now, are you going to reinstate that route when the road works are completed or not? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I can confirm, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as it is today, our intention is that that service will be restored. Uh, the works on Hyde Road you know, will have significant disruption to services. We are introducing nine additional vehicles each day into the services to you know, maintain the services that are there in terms of reliability and service punctuality. 
Uh, you know, we, we did approach Manchester City Council uh, to see if there, there were alternative ways of doing the works on Hyde Road to provide a third lane at peak times. Unfortunately, that wasn't possible. Okay, thanks for that. Um, I have asked officers actually to, for all the operators that have put down services, that the other reason they've been too coffee is due to roadworks. We're now storing it on a separate system. So after those roadworks finished, then TFG and GM officers can automatically contact them and say, you know, if things are being re, um, resubmitted. Okay, anybody else got any more questions on that? I've got Beth. So my questions are regarding the proposed withdrawal of the X41 service. Um, 4,000 people today have signed a petition to keep the X41 service running. The loss of this service will require greater expense to travel into the city centre and there's a lot of worry in the local community from people who work in Manchester and have moved to Ramsbottom specifically based on this transport link. Please could you provide me with some more information and offer some comments on the following questions I'm asking on behalf of councillors Claire, Kevin and Thomas in Ramsbottom. Firstly, how does the change help the people in Ramsbottom get to the city centre and back via a bus route without having to buy tickets from different providers at extra expense to themselves? And could TFGM work with Transdev to incorporate Ramsbottom into the X43 route? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I can give a uh, response to that. I mean, we run the X41 um, for, for, for many years. We diverted it to serve Ramsbottom in April 2008, uh, 18 rather, to um, see if we could stimulate some additional travel from that market um, in response to requests from, uh, following on from the end of the X35 a few months before. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't reached the level of use that, that it needs to be. There's about 75 customers a day travelling from Ramsbottom into Manchester on that. Um, We've put in some alternatives uh, to, to the, to the rest, of the, rest of the route. Unfortunately, that's the solution for Ramsbottom does require a change either to the tram or to um, another bus in, in Manchester. I will say I have a meeting this afternoon um, with some local stakeholders um, just to explore this further. Um, so perhaps I could offer to the chair and to get a a summary of what happens from that meeting back to you um, on there. So apologies, I can't, the meeting had been yesterday, it might have been helpful, but I, I can't give you a detailed uh, answer to that until, until uh, probably Monday, because there's a second meeting on Monday if needed as well. So hopefully that helps. Yeah, if you can make sure Beth receives that feedback, that'd be great. Thank you. Has anybody got any other questions? David? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, just to note on that, that TFGM will also be at the meeting this, this afternoon, so it will give us the opportunity then to revisit whether there are various ways of us being able to work with Transdev to address the issues raised. Thank you. David? Thank you, Chair. This is about the withdrawal of the 130. Um, th this is a really, really disappointing move. It's a really retrograde move, in my view. When we're trying to get more people to use public transport, to use the bus network, to access Metrolink, the, the fact that this is now suddenly um, being cut, the warning that this is going to be cut was quite narrow, actually, um, is, is incredibly disappointing. I've got signatures here from people who depend on this service, and the fact that it's being cut primarily because apparently it's no longer commercially viable, again, for me personally, shows why we need bus reform within Greater Manchester. I understand that D&G are going to look at running um, some, of the, some of the route, the, uh, the uh, Cheshire uh, side of the route, but for people within uh, Cheadle and within my community who need, for example, to access breast screening services in Macclesfield and um, depend on the 130, now they're not going to be able to do so, so they're not going to be able to do it as easy as, as they could. And in addition to that as well, those who want to use the Metrolink at East Didsbury, um, again, this is another service that, that is, um, you know, could have supported that, could have got more people onto public transport, and now this is being cut. It's really, really disappointing. Um, and we've got a fa the fact as well that we've got a section of Heel Green, which is now going to be um, unserved. By bus, um, by bus services as well on, on, on Wilmslow Road. Um, again, when we want people to use public transport, when, we, when we're looking to de you know, develop um, resi more residential properties in areas um, that, again, are going to need to be served by public transport, to see this being cut is really, really frustrating. So I'd like to know how this is going to be mitigated, or if it can be mitigated, 
Um, and really, just, just, to, just for your general comments, really, on why you feel this, this is necessary. It's really, really disappointing. I urge you to reconsider. Um, and like I say, in Cheadle, um, at, at the moment, in order to get home from, um, from um, Manchester on the bus, um, unless, you get, unless you want to get home before 7 o'clock, you're knackered because there aren't any buses going to Cheadle from Manchester after 7 o'clock. So again, this, this just shows for, for me that, how we've got a bus network at the moment that really, for me, isn't working. And it's working too much, really, for commercial operators. So I want to know why you feel this is going to be cut, how it's going to be mitigated, and really, do you feel, you know, do you acknowledge that this really is a retrograde step in terms of was wanting to get more people to use public transport? Thank you. Angley, could you want to come in on the same one before I bring the operator in? Yeah, I just wanted to very quickly come uh, on the back of the uh, uh, Councillor Meller's uh, comments. Um, I'm, we are equally concerned about the uh, cuts uh, of the bus 130, especially um, we are concerned about how people are going to be affected that are travelling from South Manchester into North Cheshire, and we also have got exactly the same questions. You want me to say that? So obviously the Riva service. Uh, to just to pick up on what Councillor Mellor said, yes, it's, it's based purely on a commercial decision. Um, in the four and a bit years that I've been with the Reaver, the 130 has lost money hand over fist. We moved it out from our Manchester depot down to operate from Macclesfield um, to, in two stages over two years. Uh, we did that because Macclesfield has a lower cost base um, than the Manchester depot. That had, <coughs> excuse me, had absolutely no effect on the financial performance of the service. It's a massive drain on the, on the business, um, and that's, that's the, the reason we've taken to withdraw the service. We've tried all sorts with it. Um, prior to me joining Areva, we, we, we branded it as a Sapphire route, and did a lot of work on promoting it. Um, unfortunately, non, nothing we've done with it has worked. And perhaps I could just, for... Um, I've been around Manchester 40 years, thereabouts. In 1980, uh, I was at a depot at Butchfields Road, and if the, the older, me older members here might remember where it was, at the bottom of Butchfields Road, junction with Morsley Road. At that point, we operated, I think, three buses on the Manchester Macclesfield service. It didn't make money then. It's, you know, it, it's, we've, we've, we've tried everything with it, and it, it isn't, it is not, whatever we've done with it has gone, it's not got any better, and we just can't sustain it any longer. Okay. Um, anybody got any more comments before I move on to Annex B? Sorry, Angie. Yeah, it was also to come in about the 130. Um, is it possible to investigate it becoming um, a subsidised service um, if it is going to be withdrawn as a commercial service? Because um, what people in other parts of Greater Manchester might not be aware of. Um, Councillor Mel referred to breast screening services. We've lost our breast screening, screening service in Stockport. And so women either have to go to Macclesfield, Tameside, or into Manchester. And the south of Stockport is to Macclesfield. Um, and that's one reason why a service <coughs> like this is very important. It might not make a lot of money, but to those women going to Macclesfield. I actually made a journey from Romilly using public transport. It took me three hours and cost £10.50 on buses, again, because there was no joint ticketing. So I echo what he says. OK. Oh, sorry, John. Um, just, just to add to that, um, the in terms of getting people from that area uh, linked in with the Metrolink, um, there is a real danger that, that we're missing a trick here and not, in, not encouraging people onto the Metrolink. We already have a problem in East Didsbury um, with a lot, of pe a lot more people driving to the station than getting on, uh, getting on trams um, and parking on residential streets as well. So it, it would certainly be a lack of encouragement to use public transport and integrated public transport if this service goes. So I would certainly endorse us looking at whether or not there is the viability of a, of a subsidised um, um, service to replace this. Nick? Um, we do have D&G here who I don't know whether they want to come in and just make a comment. They're doing the other side of the border, whether there would be any consideration of them moving into the Greater Manchester side. 
what the reasons are for that. Look, I recognise the comments around the table. I, I feel the passion in the room. We'll certainly go away and look at it. I think the problem when we initially look at what's around there at the moment, there is no easy solution. We don't think there's anything that is immediately sustainable, partly because of the reflection that Councillor Mellor said is that we don't control everything and there's lots of bits and pieces and there's no obvious thing that, that could make it cost effective. That doesn't mean to say, in light of the comments that have been made quite passionately, that we won't go away and have another look at it. So we'll certainly do that on behalf of the comments that have been made. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, my name's Chris Almond. I'm the Bus Network Manager for D&G. Um, we're taking on the service from Monday the 27th. We're only running between Macclesfield and Handforth, and that's for several reasons. Um, following significant surveys on the buses by ourselves and Cheshire East Council, it um, highlighted to us that only 25% of the overall passengers used the bus within the Greater Manchester area. Now that's on a service that only takes three buses to run it, so if you do the maths, a third of the resource in vehicles to carry a quarter of the passengers. Added to that, from an operational point of view, running a service that's an hour one way, an hour back, is much more efficient for us and we did actually do some costings for Cheshire East Council which they rejected in the end on cost basis that it's too expensive for us to add that on as a subsidised service from their point of view uh, because it, it virtually doubles the number of drivers hours that we were required to pay by providing the extension into Greater Manchester so unfortunately uh, we decided to just operate it wholly within Cheshire East. Okay, thanks for that explanation and thanks for looking into it as well for the councillors. If you can refer back to them as well. Annex B. Annex B, just a short one where we felt we would uh, look into uh, a local link solution for a very short of the, uh, part of the journey where the 715 was going to come off. So if a May chair goes straight into Annex C and any comments or questions relating to Annex C and changes we've made to the subsidised services. Anybody got any comments on that? Yep, John. Um, thank you, Chair. First of all, I've got a couple of, um, a couple of well, a comment and, and a question um, more generally about um, decisions around Annex C. Uh, the, the, the comment is we have previously um, uh, consistently at these, at these meetings uh, talked about services that have gone from 30 minutes every 30 minutes to every 40 minutes or 20 to 30 um, and often these are services that are being reduced in frequency that have already previously been re reduced in frequency at an earlier time. I remember Councillor Burke made a comment uh, about a local service that he was aware of that had gone I think from 20 or every 20 minutes to I think it might have been even as, as infrequently as every hour. When we get these reports, we don't know how these services have already been reduced previously. And I thought there was agreement that we would get some more information when these, uh, when these things were being brought forward uh, to show how services had changed over time rather than the specific change that was being proposed now. Because uh, if a service had been every 20 minutes and then eventually ends up as every hour, it, that is a massive um, change in the in, in the frequency. So I would like to see a bit more information um, on on specific services, and I think that moves neatly onto the the 245 service. Now I'm not saying I disagree with what's being proposed on the 245 service, but the information that we've been given here doesn't actually tell us what the service that we will get in the future will really look like. It just says what's being removed, but it doesn't actually tell us what's going to be there in future. So I'd just like a bit more information, even if it's in an, in an appendix, so that we've got the information on those services that we can reference to have a look at whether or not actually it doesn't, it, it doesn't seem like this service is, is, uh, is, is sufficient enough now. My other general point was a question about the, the whole franchising process. I appreciate no decisions being made yet, um, but once a decision has been made, will there be, if, if 
it's decided to go to a franchise model. Uh, will there then be a, a stop in decisions being made about changes to subsidised services until a decision might be made in the future about what, ser what services will look like in general? Because if we end up making, if a decision is made to go to a franchise model and then we continue to make some decisions about uh, reducing services, um, we might actually be, we, we might be making decisions too soon. And I just wondered whether there'd been any sort of discussions about whether or not, if we were to go down the franchising model, whether or not we would, we, there would then be a pause in delay on uh, changes to subsidised services. Uh, and then I had two, two specific um, services to, to make some comments on, if I could, Chair. Uh, one is, uh, and first of all, I'd, I'd like to add the apology of uh, Councillor Sykes, who would have spoken on these two items had he not been um, very ill. So, and you'll have to appreciate, uh, this is not my area, so I don't know these services particularly well. And he would be far better qualified to speak on these services than I am. Uh, but I have had some feedback from some of the local councillors. I don't know whether that feedback's been passed on to you, but um, in relation to the 403 service, uh, the local councillors have raised some concerns about um, lack of consultation or, or the lack of consultation coming too late. Um, they, they've uh, specifically talked in, in, in the Crompton Ward, they've particularly raised concerns about the high proportion of elderly residents um, in the area. It's recently been awarded the Age Friendly Neighbourhood Award and they are seriously concerned about the, um, the inability of um, some of their older residents to get to the services that are alternative services. Um, they've also raised a specific concern about the, uh, the reliability of the 59 service um, that is the alternative bus service um, for this uh, 403 service. So what they've asked, it, given that the decision is not, the, the change in service is not due to April, whether or not that decision could be deferred to the uh, to to another to the next meeting, um, to have an opportunity to have uh, consultation between TFGM and the local councillors about possible alternative options to what's being proposed uh, for the 403, um, and then the other um, service is in relation to the the 353, 354, 355, 356, and 407 service which again is a fairly, fairly complex uh, set of changes. Um, the, uh, the local councillors there have suggested that the, um, that the local link service will not be sufficient. Um, uh, there will be now more areas that wouldn't be served by um, public transport and some specific comments about the, the distance that some people will have to travel. So um, on the Palingwood Road uh, in Delft, they'll have to travel up to 700 metres uh, up a steep hill to the nearest bus. Uh, and then on Church Road and Well Meadow Lane in Upper Mill, up to 640 metres up a steep hill to the nearest bus. We're quite lucky in South Manchester, it's not quite so hilly, um, but 600 metres up a steep hill is quite a, quite a trek for, for older people. Um, Station Road and Grove Road in Upper Mill, up to 500 metres to the nearest bus. And High Grove Road and Church Road in Friesland, up to 500 metres up a steep hill to the, um, to the, to the nearest bus. And Shaw Hall Bank Road in Friesland, there's no mention in the, in the report um, of the distance for people travelling to the nearest bus. So again, this decision's not due to be uh, implemented till April, and the <coughs> local councillors would appreciate if, that, if a decision on that was deferred uh, for some further consultation with the, with the local uh, members and the local community to see whether there is an alternative option for that. Thank you. Okay, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave the franchise question to someone more important than me I'm very much a I'm very much a business as usual person so um, in terms of in terms of the report um, I mean and this is linked to and, and this is linked to to the other parts of the questions I think we acknowledge that 
we, we kind of need to review the reports anyway, because I think this is this is need to be better in terms of some of the information we give, and, and I think we've, we've kind of discussed that. So we take on board some of your comments, and I think it's become a bit dated, and I think we could be better at the way we present it. So that, that's points that we will take forward. Um, in, in terms of the specific services, um, it's not the place to go into the specific details because we're not all from Saddleworth, but we've had quite a lot of feedback on this, so I know all the details. I think what I will say at this particular point is looking at the bigger picture, um, the, the planners have gone into a lot of detail in terms of the, the routes that, that you quoted, um, as they were, were not going to be sustainable, um, and, and, and therefore we had to look at doing something differently. Um, we believe that what we are promoting is something that is a lot simpler, a lot better for the customer. Um, again, it's probably not been presented that well in the report, because I think people look at the particular sections and think, my bus is coming off. We've had one or two complaints that have come in and said, I think it's disgraceful what you're doing to my bus service, but their bus service has actually improved. So they're just not quite understanding what we're promoting. There are sections of, of the route that aren't as well served, but these are sections of the route where use is really, really poor and that we're covering it with local link. And at any other committee, we would be agreeing to do that. So I think what we will do, uh, and there's better linkages for Saddleworth users, uh, better linkages to some of the rail times that we've had to uh, address because of the changes in December. So as an overall package, there are so many more positives to this. But I get the way it came across in the report, it doesn't look as good. So what we will commit to do very early on next week, particularly around the councillor feedback we have, I think councillor Hartness came to us and wanted to discuss it. And anyone else who is interested is we will go and speak and almost for want of a better phrase, sell what we've done here. Uh, because again, we've had even compliments. Some people have actually com uh, come to us and said, actually, what you've done is really good. And we don't get that very often. So I think, I think when you stand back and look at the bigger picture, this is actually a really good piece of work at a stage when we don't control everything and we have a limited reverse, uh, resources that actually tries to do something that hopefully will be a lot better. But I acknowledge that sometimes the way it's presented isn't that good in that committee uh, style. So we'll commit to doing that. And just picking up on, on the, the consultation, I think what's really pleased is with Eamon's letters going out, is actually this has provoked some debate. And you're quite right, these services aren't starting till April, so we have got three months. It's created the debate, it's created some impact, it's created some consultation between members of the public. And that does give us some time, again with a committee in February, to go back and do a bit more work. So none of these are done deals, and that will go back with looking at the 403. Again, I think we can demonstrate there that there are suitable alternatives, subject with this guy on my right sorting out the 59 reliability, which we'll speak to him about that. But I, th but I think that is a positive. So again, I, th I think we can build on some good stuff here. Um, so again, committed to, to going back early next week, speaking to colleagues. I'm hoping that might have addressed Councillor Fielding's question around a similar area. Okay. But before I bring you in, I'll bring Eamon in just to reply to the other bit. I think clearly um, it's been appropriate to, to comment too much on um, the conclusion of the, uh, the consultation on, on options for, for bus. But whatever the decision is taken, there will be a period of time um, where services will still be operated by the commercial operators under existing arrangements, and therefore they'll have to have the flexibility to be able to take commercial decisions for however long that period is. Okay, Sean. Yeah, well, there is a, a feeling of disappointment about the overall reduction in, in services for Saddleworth, but I'm quite realistic that we are where we are. We have a lower budget than we would like and than we used to have to provide subsidised services, and so that's why we're in the position we're in. I do, however, think when we're using this measure of 400 metres to the nearest bus stop, there's something to be said for taking into account, account the topography of different areas. Uh, Councillor Leach is absolutely right that in South Manchester it's flat, in Saddleworth it's not. Uh, and so while it might not be an unreasonable distance to get to the nearest bus stop where these alternative services are provided, some of them are indeed up very steep hills, and that's why Saddleworth, of course, is walking country. Um, the 356 in particular, 
The 356 was introduced to provide links of, for the Saddleworth villages to Greenfield Railway Station, and notwithstanding the debate that we had earlier, it should be, we should be able to assume that trains will arrive on time. And so the proposed timetable for the 356 under these arrangements that are being suggested does not interwork very well with the uh, train arrivals and departures at Greenfield Station. So I'll just ask if there's an opportunity to look at the timetabling of the revised 356 service so that we can provide that connectivity. Because we always talk here about our network and how brilliant yeah. it's going to be, an integration between different, different modes, but these proposals are a step backwards in that respect and we should be moving much closer to providing that integration between rail and different bus services. Right. Any more questions? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, moving on. Uh, before I move on to item 10, I'll just take a, I think we'll all just take a comfort break, allowing the operators, if you want to stay, please do. If not, some of you, I'll see you later on this afternoon. Okay, thanks again for taking, uh, for, for attending and taking some flack, that, but that's what you're here for, to be honest. Okay, thank you. Take five minutes.
Okay, can we take our places again, please? Let's crack on. Okay, item 10, transport and climate change. Okay, and we want to hand over to yep. Simon for this one. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, I will be brief because in the first instance, this is much more of a scene setting report uh, for uh, the committee in advance of um, more detailed advice that we'll be bringing forwards um, through through the year. But just, just briefly to uh, take members through the, the, the substance of the report. So, uh, as you will recall, members have been keen to establish uh, transport and climate change as an, an issue uh, for the committee uh, through the work programme. What this report does in particular is to set out, firstly, the, the, the scale of the challenge ahead and, this, and, and that it is a significant uh, challenge not only to meet uh, the final deadlines associated with uh, net zero carbon emissions for Greater Manchester, but also recognising that we have to do that within a given budget, and therefore year on year to that point of zero emissions, we need to be able to uh, deliver uh, progress. Uh, and the report also sets out uh, the headline requirements um, that uh, were articulated within the uh, analysis that sat behind uh, the Greater Manchester Five-Year Environment Plan, uh, which was uh, published last year. And, and that requires a step change in both modal shift and also uh, in terms of the vehicle engine types um, that we have on our uh, streets. Um, we have uh, focused as Greater Manchester, um, I'm keen to stress in the report, on investment uh, in public transport and also more latterly uh, active travel um, over the past decade that means that we do find ourselves in a better position than we would have otherwise been um, uh, as, uh, as Greater Manchester. Uh, and that is an, is an incredibly important position to start from. We have also um, looked to get ahead in terms of developing Greater Manchester's role uh, within the provision of electric vehicle charging infrastructure so that we look to provide some forms um, of, uh, of local support in terms of uh, that shift to electromobility that's going to be crucial alongside a modal shift agenda um, in order to uh, the, achieve the right outcomes. And of course, we are looking uh, both through funding submissions uh, to government around uh, transport infrastructure and transport services and also the funding submissions that we are making around the clean air plan uh, to accelerate the level of provision um, in both. However, it is, it is absolutely right to state from the outset that the extent to which we can meet the challenges Greater Manchester will be as well hugely dependent on how government responds to the agenda uh, that we give to them, particularly in terms of providing sustainable long-term funding arrangements around all aspects of the provision of sustainable travel alternatives in Greater Manchester. And we have already started to open a dialogue with the new government um, around that. And also in terms of how government goes about establishing the conditions to encourage an accelerated shift to uh, electric vehicle uptake at a, at a national level. Uh, and that's why um, the, uh, there are a series of very clear steps that we've um, set out in the report, which is both about reviewing our own plans within Greater Manchester uh, in very close partnership with district officers through uh, the Transport Strategy Group um, that we have in place, and also drawing in the expertise of the university's Tyndall Centre who advised on the preparation um, of the five-year environment plan so that we are very clear as Greater Manchester that all of our priorities are pointed 
uh, towards um, supporting uh, the carbon targets that we have set for ourselves, but also that there is intensive um, engagement with government uh, and we have a process that we're putting in place in that regard, not only to engage specifically as Greater Manchester and Transport for Greater Manchester, but also collectively through both the Core Cities Network and the Urban Transport Group, so that we can make sure that um, as government brings policy forward, it is bringing policy forward that is informed by the issues that we face here in Greater Manchester and across our cities, rather than us then looking to respond to a government policy that doesn't have that local level input. I shall leave it there, Chair. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. Anybody got any questions on this? Norman? A question, Chair, it's a comment. For some months, when we first mentioned uh, clean air, we, we were told about, about highways agency not, not being part of this. They could get away with anything. They could do anything. And we were saying, well, let's lobby government and see what they say. Well, yeah, but this government, you know, it's, it's untenable. We don't know how long it'll last. We don't know how the transport minister's going to be. We've got a government now with a large majority. We know who the transport uh, minister's going to be. It's time to step up the pressure. And one of the jobs of Greater Manchester Transport Committee, and indeed GMCA, is to lobby government and let's lobby them and put the pressure on and say, what are you doing about the highways agency, about these motorways that run through Greater Manchester and are given carte blanche as to what, they, what emissions they can produce or anything? Let's put the pressure on. Um, so just to reassure members that we, uh, we did lobby government throughout 2019 regardless of political makeup of, of government at, at any one moment in time uh, around these, is, uh, these issues. So this is an issue that we understand is high on uh, the agenda of the Secretary of State. In order to reaffirm that, there is a report that's being prepared at the moment for the Combined Authority at the end of this month that will um, remind uh, leaders within the Combined Authority that where we are in terms of the preparation of the Clean Air Plan and the lobbying messages and there's also uh, an engagement activity that we're putting in the diaries of uh, MPs uh, down in Parliament in early February to pick up on the same points as well. So I can assure members that we are very, very keen uh, to reach a position both in terms of funding and also the relationship between the Clean Air Plan and uh, Highways England as quickly as possible now that we have um, the government back. I think I would also stress that is the activity that we're undertaking around the clean air plant, specifically focused on addressing nitrogen dioxide problems. What we're looking to set out here is a much broader based agenda, which is about addressing uh, the principal carbon issues, for which at times there is good overlap between how you address nitrogen dioxide and at other times it requires um, far further additional activities well and beyond um, the clean air plant itself. Okay, um, thank you, Chair. I think I agree. It's a helpful and honest scene-setting report um, that focuses the mind on the discussion on where are we up to with delivering carbon emissions on transport, but also how does that impact on the rest of the emissions direct, that is, emissions that we are emitting as a combined authority. I agree with you also that it does make the, te the, the case for investment in public transport and uh, projects to be delivered on the ground uh, much more urgent. Um, and also it tells how desperately, given previous items and previous discussions, we need a step change in the way that we travel across the conurbation. I think that the asks um, that we have made through the mayor around electrification of the northern hub to improve connectivity, journey times and capacity, around supports with the stationary developments and Piccadilly train station as well, um, taking action, picking up the pace on ongoing infrastructure delivery project or ongoing delays on infrastructure projects. Um, also, as uh, 
Councillor Warren said, uh, uh, taking action on the, the clean air, we still have yet to hear from the government on the, the fund, on the clean air fund to support our businesses, our taxes and uh, vehicles across the conurbation to uh, swap into a cleaner fleet. However, um, this is all about strategy. There's a lot here about strategy. Uh, young people have, to have told us three things, and there's currently a summit taking place just around the corner of um, young people across the city. They told us to listen to the science, and we are listening to the science. We're working with the Tyndall Centre. They told us to tell the truth, and this report has got some pretty big truths that I would like to put in very simple English, if I may. But it also talks about taking action now. I think that the key takeaway that I have got from this report is that the analysis of what is possible in the transport sector needs to be coordinated with parallel work that is currently taking place on energy and buildings. If we are saying, and I think that this report probably does, um, says that transport can't reduce its emissions in the next five years by 50%. This means that other sectors will inevitably have to do more. And we need to make this much more explicit. Um, in the next, um, um, I think in the next few months, we need to make sure that the different sectors are working together rather than working in silos. And I think that currently, this is a danger that we are being presented. Um, I have seen the recommendations and I have hummed and ahed about them. Um, I think that um, we, the, 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 there is a, a need for the uh, 2040 delivery plan to be reviewed in its entirety um, to ensure that proposals um, in it make the maximum contribution to achieving zero carbon. Um, and I think that these recommendations here are, are just a little bit kind of like business as usual. So working with the Tyndall to wait for recommendations um, let's review the, the, see if we've got the, the right mix and the vision to, to, to do things. Strategy is very, very important. Working together is very, very important, but people want to see us action on the ground. So I look forward to working with um, the Walking and Cycling Commission to ask for more funding from the government. This is something tangible that we can do in Greater Manchester and hopefully within the next five years. I think we share the same vision in that. Uh, with the work, Walking and Cycling Commission. I think that we need to make the spending review asks very, very robust, and I think that we need to go out all guns blazing to the government to ask. They have made significant promises. We need them to be materialised. Time is not on our side in this area, and I'm so pleased that you have brought this report early this January, and I, am also, I also want to make a recommendation to bring something to the committee as soon as you can in terms of how we are moving forward with this. Thank you. Um, and the, the point is incredibly well made that the scale of the challenge uh, for the first five years alone for transport suggests that it is going to be incredibly challenging, if not impossible, for transport to be able to meet all of its requirement within the first five years. That's the reason why we have the Green City Partnership model in place um, in Greater Manchester, so that we can manage uh, the carbon budgets for the city region um, at, a, at a program level. And I think the point's well made that in focusing specifically around transport, we probably haven't brought that issue out sufficiently. And in bringing further advice back to members, I'll explain how our programme sits within a broader carbon programme for the city region. Thank you. I want to bring in Chris. Who wants to... Do you want to say something on this? Uh, no, no, no. Just uh, when we get around to this, I think... Oh, answer it in some of the... Right, OK. Uh, I've got John. Uh, just very briefly, just picking up on the point that Councillor Warren made, um, do we? Act, I I don't know exactly which roads in Greater Manchester are considered to be the strategic road network. I mistakenly assumed that the Mancunian Way was part of the strategic road network, but it's not. So, uh, can you sort of point me in the right direction of how where we'd actually find which roads are and which roads aren't? Yeah, we'll we'll happily circulate a map to members. Um, there are very very few trunk roads in Greater Manchester, so it is principally the motorway network, but there remain one or two trunk roads left in Greater Manchester. Okay, anybody else got any more questions on this? Angie? Um, just a quick one. Um, what are the plans for increasing the number of charging points for electric vehicles? 
Um, so we currently have uh, 160 locations um, across Greater Manchester with dual-headed uh, points. There is a, uh, a small increase on that which we are rolling out at the moment through some early funding that we secured through the Clean Air Plan. However, through the core Clean Air Plan, our proposal in the first instance is to double that provision within the Greater Manchester EV network by 2021. Uh, and what we are now starting to do is to engage with commercial providers because it's important to note that the GMAV network over the next few years will not be the only form of electric charging, uh, but we think we can use it for good specific charging um, services, particularly around pro uh, providing charging services for taxis, for example. Okay. Right, moving on. Item 11, Streets for All, made to move progress update, and I've got Jonathan and Nicola that's going to take this. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we'll try and keep this as brief as we can. Um, this report is in two parts. So the first part is to give an overview of progress on developing our Streets for All approach, and the second part is an update on um, progress towards delivering um, Chris Baldwin's made to move um, against Chris Baldwin's made to move recommendations. Um, so just to give you a quick overview on on Streets for All, um, this is um, a, an approach which we've designed to help us deliver that 50%. Um, mode share um, and it's starting to tackle some of the challenges we face on our highway network in doing that and how we accommodate um, a range of different modes on our highway network whilst at the same time trying to tackle big issues like air quality, uh, carbon emissions, congestion and so on. Uh, so it very much focuses on um, accommodating um, uh, looking at how we move people across different parts of our road network, recognising that different streets play different roles. So some are very much about moving uh, people and vehicles. Others are much more place-focused, so they're for people to spend time in. Um, and that we need to um, acknowledge that um, and design streets accordingly. And we've been doing a huge amount of work with district colleagues over the last um, 18 months, two years, to develop this agenda. Um, and there are three main parts of that. The first is to develop a strategy um, document, which we're intending to publish in the summer. Um, but we also wanted to test out what that would look like in practice. So we've been uh, working on a number of corridor studies, uh, working with local officers, members, stakeholders, to look at how you might apply this approach in practice on, on a number of quite challenging corridors across the conurbation. Uh, and then finally, we're, we're starting to work on a design guide. So actually looking at taking some of those principles and saying, what would that actually look like in terms of a set of standards, which we can, we can all sign up to and, and work with. Um, it's quite difficult to explain Streets Rule just in words, so we've just put together a, a short slide pack just to hopefully bring it to life for you, and uh, Jonathan will, will take you through that before we hand over to Chris. Thank you. Yes, so I'll just take you through um, a small number of slides. I'll, I'll go through these relatively quickly just in the, in the interest of time, but uh, happy to take any questions afterwards. Um, but yeah, do, the idea is that the slides hopefully bring together uh, or bring to life a bit more of the content that's in the paper and provide an overview of um, Streets for All and how it builds on the policy direction that's been set out in the 2040 Transport Strategy and strengthened by the, the Made to Move agenda in, in Greater Manchester. The um, Streets for All policy direction set out in 2040 um, is, is very much also looking to um, deliver on these um, uh, key issues. Um, we, we've just talked about um, tackling emissions and creating clean air, um, the need to improve public health. And streets are all, uh, as a, most of our trips are made on our street network in Greater Manchester, can play a key role within that. And that supports us also in, therefore, taking forward, improving active travel as, as well, and, and particularly safety on our transport network as well. As Nicola said, um, this is very much framed in us um, uh, creating modal shift and, and getting more people using uh, walking, cycling and using public transport and, and as was set out in the delivery plan how we're looking to um, shift that um, from car use and, and also with doing that um, accommodate the growth that's planned um, in travel across Greater Manchester um, with particular emphasis on tackling those shorter trips and, um, and encouraging more public transport in particular to our um, major town and city centres. So on, on page five of the paper, we set out um, this, this vision, um, which um, we've captured from the conversations that we've had um, with stakeholders over um, the last 12 months or so. 
Uh, very much emphasising that we're planning for more people walking and cycling and using public transport. Um, but there will continue to be journeys made by car. Um, but if we want um, people to use public transport and walk and cycle more, we do need to make those environments, those streets, um, uh, more people-centred. Um, <coughs> so the strategy is very much how we um, approach decisions for how we manage our streets and design them uh, for, for people. Within the 2040 strategy, we set out um, these, these key principles. Um, apologies, I wasn't using the slides. Um, these key principles, which are very much at the heart of um, the strategy document and, and very much ground uh, what we're trying to push forward um, with, um, with Streets for All. And that work has uh, also um, been focused around, as Nicola was saying, through the corridor work, particularly looking at some of our street types um, recognising that streets in Greater Manchester vary greatly. There's not a one-size-fits-all one um, solution to improving each of the streets, um, and their roles vary from time of day, um, day of the week, um, whether it's school drop-off or pick-up time, for example. Um, so the slide summarises um, those different street types from those on the left-hand side, which are places where um, are more for people walking and cycling, those destination places, those active neighbourhoods, um, through to streets, roads, which are more about moving traffic, particularly um, larger volumes of traffic and, um, and larger vehicles as well, that are HGVs. So looking at the role of our streets in this way helps us to balance um, those complex demands of everyone who uses and lives or works alongside our streets in Greater Manchester. And then just some examples of those kind of streets. So parts of our key route network, um, Simage uh, of Regent Road, our connector roads, um, some of our key radials into the city centre, example here, Chapel Street and the A6 in, in Greater Manchester. Um, our high streets, and, and this is uh, the image of, of Altrincham Town Centre, um, key vibrant um, streets where we have the mix of people walking, cycling and using public transport. And then our active neighbourhoods as well, are more of our residential streets, um, which um, uh, you know, particularly through uh, the B network agenda, the focus around getting more people walking and cycling in, in those environments. And, and then our destination places, our um, town and city centre squares, um, where we want more people to be um, dwelling, spending time in celebrating um, those places within the centres uh, of our um, key towns and cities. So in, in terms of next steps, um, we're um, working with stakeholders to finalise um, the, the strategy and um, uh, particularly with our uh, district um, uh, officers and we're having conversations um, with um, particular um, officers and members in, in the coming um, weeks on that and some of them we, we've had or, or already so with the intention to publish the strategy in, in the summer and this year. Um, as Nicola said, we're continuing to build on the corridor studies that have been undertaken and in particular um, taking forward small scheme development activity that um, can um, make our streets better for people um, to access bus services and also to in particularly cycle and walk along. And, and then finally, um, the Streets for All design guide that um, we're working on, which does provide the standards and framework that will help in our decision making around uh, the right uh, investments that we need to make in our streets going forward. So I'll um, finish there and happy to take any questions. Just bring in Chris first, just for the summer. Um, yes, thank you. when this programme started. So the urgency here is absolutely huge. Put that into context, um, just to remind everybody, 30% of our journeys in a car are less than a kilometre. Five, uh, five kilometre journeys uh, were up to about 80-something percent of our car journeys. So the potential here 
as embarrassing as that is, is, is fantastic. So that's just so important to understand that, to know why this whole agenda is, is critical. So we're concerned over, I was a little bit concerned over time to get to, to mobilization. I'm happy to say there's lots of great work that's gone on in the last few months to, uh, to rectify that. Um, I met with leaders a month ago and transport leads. Uh, and unanimously, they agreed uh, to publish a three-year delivery timetable so we can all put pressure on ourselves to show what we're going to do and make that 10-year vision down to a one-year vision, what I have to do this year and next year, which I think is essential to keep if we're going to get real progress um, rather than just thinking about it to really get us mobilised. Um, also, excitingly, um, each district has agreed to applying the standards in the Made to Move document to all walking and cycling uh, work going on, regardless of how it's funded. And that led to, um, as, as Jonathan mentioned, a Streets for All design guide um, being developed uh, as we speak <coughs> to make sure we get consistency of quality that will genuinely give people a viable and attractive choice to the driving um, across the region. And it's very important that that is embedded in how we do business here, as opposed to just being a guide that can be used or not used. And I think that's the next step, but there's a real appetite to do that. Uh, it will be the highest standards in all of the UK if used in that way, which I think is very exciting. We've got, as you saw by the paper, there are 82 schemes. Now we've had six tranches with a value when delivered of uh, just under half a billion pounds, which will deliver uh, a third, a fully third of the network, which is great. We've had to pause taking in new schemes. The appetite was there, which is great, um, because we didn't want a paper network. We don't want to spend all of the money that we've got at the moment in creating a design and not actually doing anything. So that was the right thing to do. But it does show you what happens with start-stop funding when you get a grant. You are limited and you have to keep stopping. So we're working on that uh, at the moment. We're in the final throes, actually, uh, on one-off funding of creating a cycling and walking investment paper to put in front of government. Uh, it was mentioned earlier about putting pressure on government. Well, this is it. You said you wanted us to do this. This is what it looks like for 10 years, and we can only do it if you back it. So I'm quite excited uh, about getting that up, so we hope to have that out by the end of the month. In the, after that, I think that we have a very strong case. We've done all that strat strategic work. We have a network designed by the people who live here. We've got the methodology and know what we want to do to, uh, to deliver it. Uh, but we've got to now demonstrate our speed. And I think 2020 is critical for that, to show that we can actually deliver this stuff, not just design it. So it's really uh, an important year. And I'm happy to say uh, TFGM have done some great work they're all looking at the moment how we can streamline and speed up the process from our side. A lot of it rests with the district, districts, it has to be said. We've engaged what I believe is the first uh, in the country, a cycling and walking commissioner in Rich Nixon, who's sitting over there, and may very well be taking uh, this position next time we report back to you, which would be um, delightful. And um, we have also set up a training scheme pioneered by uh, Brian Deegan, one of our consultants, that's now delivered 5,500 hours of training to officers so people are capable of doing this stuff uh, and are all doing it in the same way, which I think is absolutely brilliant. Uh, Behaviour change and risk reduction are areas uh, that we're really focusing on now as well. So we're creating safe space, that's underway. Uh, that programme's being developed at pace and we have an expert in that area now on the books. Risk reduction... I think, as the paper outlines, we're not succeeding there. In fact, we're going backwards uh, at the moment. Despite making up four, just 4% of the distance travelled, vulnerable road users are accounting for 50% of the KSIs, and we're seeing more deaths in this group uh, from being hit by drivers than we are homicides, but it doesn't attract the same attention. Um, so we're meeting with police next week. And I'm hoping that the result of that meeting will see a risk reduction strategy emerge pretty quickly. Again, we know what we want to do. One of the problems police have always faced is funding. As we all know, uh, huge demands, uh, as have been demonstrated in the last week in the news, there's huge demands on their time. Um, so we have some innovative ways to help us self-fund. So, for example, keeping funds from uh, moving traffic offences locally, which has been done before, to allow us to help ourselves 
That's sitting with ministers now, and I hope that we have a settled government in place, that uh, we will get some news on that and several of the asks we have of them. So I think, uh, to put it into bigger context, the 2040 strategy, it's only become apparent to me, working on the investment plan, just how important this is to succeeding uh, in that area. We've got to create a million, nearly a million more journeys every day, uh, either cycling or walking. So this is absolutely critical for Manchester succeeding in, his, in its greater, uh, greater goals. I think that's it for me. Thank you. Okay, I've got Angeliki. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think I would echo what the Cycling and Working Commissioner says about the urgency to get stuff sort of done on the ground, especially when I am... Um, a bit stuck as an executive member. Uh, currently, you have closed the rounds. You have an oversubscribed uh, fund um, in terms of delivering projects on the ground. And I've got lots and lots of communities whose expectations is very, very high. And they're asking me every time, why can't we have this? When are we going to have this? So I would urge you, and I'm very pleased to hear that you are putting together an ask uh, for the government for the government in terms of getting more investments into this. Um, I'd like to ask a specific question on the, um, uh, on the presentation around the streets for all. Is there, have we got any sort of projects on the pipeline sort of to be delivered? Have we got any sort of targets? And is that, how, how does that form part of the um, five year sort of implementation plan? I understand that there is a strategy and we need to go through sort of that, but how then does that translate into sort of actual projects that we, we have on the, on the ground? Yes, through the corridor studies, we've um, developed a, a number of um, projects which which could be taken forward, um, and uh, we've been working with um, district officers around some of them. Some of them, um, we are uh, looking at funding opportunity, opportunities for them. Um, the Pinch Point Fund is, is is one example, which is a broader um, a sustainable transport um, opportunity as, as well. So, for example, in, in Manchester, um, the, there's a scheme that's come out of the streets for work which could could be going in or is planned to go into to that fund. Um, one of the other areas is, is around um, the um, high street uh, fund as well, um, where um, schemes are coming forward um, as part of uh, those um, projects. So, and, and then we have this pipeline of other schemes that are coming forward that, um, as, as um, it has been talked about with cycling and walking, it, it's now um, where we need that funding to further develop those and, and then potentially deliver those um, schemes as well, um, working closely with um, the district officers and um, members and communities. Yeah, I, I think Chris has just covered it really, but the only thing about this report that disappointed me was when I saw that table about dangers and uh, accidents and, uh, you know, uh, because I was rather hoping in Greater Manchester we'd seen the peak and we were going to start reducing. And, uh, of course, I had this um, thought in my mind that we'd not only have thousands of more cyclists and more pedestrians, but we'd actually see the figures still reducing when it came to accidents. So whether we will in the future, I don't know, but I just hope that you'll be able to talk to the police and everybody and see if we can do a bit more on that. Um, yeah, it's an area that, that we don't have a strategy. There was one asked for more than two years ago in the Made to Move um, document that was put before leaders. Uh, it's essential for people to feel safe enough to get out of the metal box because that looks attractive uh, and that hasn't happened. I know the police are under intense pressure so I think their, press their pressures have to be ours. So if the obstacle is funding then fine, we'll go and find ways that that can be solved. But we, first of all we need to know what it is we're paying for, how much will it cost, why it's going to work and then something to champion. So I'm hoping at, at last that the meeting next week will result in, uh, in a strategy to reduce risk. Yeah, thank you, Chris. I'm Richard Nixon, so I just thought I'd jump in on that as an opportunity to introduce myself as the director, uh, as opposed to the commissioner. So I'm hoping we continue to, obviously, myself and Chris will be working side by side on this, um, but I'll obviously be able to put the capacity in uh, to take forward that programme. Um, just uh, commenting on Councillor 
uh, from Manchester, absolutely. Um, in the next couple of weeks, I'll be having a series of meetings with all of the district representatives about the actual capital programme we're looking now to move forward to implementation. So I'm trying to put a bit of incentive on that. Uh, myself and Chris are analysing whether there's some early wins as well we can look at within the delivery programme to release uh, funds into, uh, into uh, getting things on the ground. Um, I'm particularly encouraged by uh, the reception I've had and the, uh, the willingness from officers to look at the way in which we look across the piece at both road risk reduction, liaising with our colleagues in the police being the first point, uh, so uh, with Beverly Hughes and Ian Hopkins, the meeting next week, I think is a very important thing to establish where they are at in how we move forward with road policing. And that then begins to form the core of moving forward to um, that road risk reduction casualty prevention strategy. And then alongside that, a piece across the whole aspects of behaviour change so that we hit all the right issues around clean air, climate change, the made to move strategy and others, so that we've got a consistent message going out there to road users and particularly children. I was reading an interesting report uh, on the train the other day, just trying to get myself up to speed with everything going on in Greater Manchester. By 2032, there'll be a million children uh, or thereabouts as part of the population. So that's 12 years from now. We've got a design standard to hit, uh, which the network should be consistent for a, so that we're confident that a 12-year-old could use it. So that gives us a big headline target to work towards. How do we get to 2032 so that population of children are equipped to use the roads safely, sustainably, uh, and in the best possible way? So that's the kind of headline approach that I'm trying to inject. Uh, I'm trying to inject a bit of direction and energy behind the whole programme, um, mixing across capital, investment, access to bikes, and uh, the behaviour change and safety uh, strategies. Uh, so I do look forward to coming along to present to this, this committee in future. And I'm hoping we will, uh, we will be making some rapid progress over the next three months with a number of papers. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of questions in relation to the, um, the GM bike hire scheme. Um, the, first, first of all, I'm interested to know what, what the, is the predicted uh, modal shift from um, from car to the uh, the bike scheme because my my worry is that and it's not worry as such but my expectation is that this is likely to get people off public transport into bikes or from walking into bikes rather than necessarily from cars into bikes and I just wondered whether uh, what the stats are from the other schemes as to how successful it was from getting people out of cars or potentially taxis maybe um, and secondly the 3.17 refers to scheme will be a docked system to increase security and reliability clearly the mobike scheme was a bit of a disaster uh, from a security and reliability uh, side, side of things. But I think one of the challenges in London particularly, um, and maybe the stats don't bear this out anymore, but I think part of the problem for some people being put off using the bikes was that they couldn't then find anywhere to dock them at their locate at the their destination because certain destinations very very popular and the bikes were always that all the all the spaces were gone so how are we going to ensure that the infrastructure is significant enough so that people aren't going to be put off because they can't find anywhere nearby to dock and then finally um uh, just a, just a, for a point of interest, really, are we going to end up with a Boardman bike or are we going to end up with a Betfred or Boddington's bike? Um, because clearly there are potentially some, uh, some advertising revenue from, from a scheme. Oh, I told me memory is good enough. Um, some of that I can't answer. So MoChIF stats, I don't know whether we haven't got the appropriate colleagues here to answer the specific uh, detail question. Um, maybe somebody can chip in um, in a moment. We've looked at about 22 schemes worldwide uh, to look at the issues. The Mobike experience, we've said before, is extremely painful and really, really useful. Uh, we found out a lot of stuff we didn't know we didn't know. Um, excitingly, um, we also know where there are examples in place that have dealt with exactly the same things in a very similar demographic. So just by way of example, um, I went to Glasgow during that same period 
uh, and used a scheme there that was working very well. Um, and that scheme, the CEO of the company kindly came to Glasgow for two hours while I was working up there and, and told me all about it. And they have a semi-docked scheme. So I used the bike while working in Glasgow. I, it had to go back to, to, for me to go stop the clock for it to go off the meter, it had to go back to a place. Um, so it knows where it is. It's geo-fenced. If the rack is full, you can leave it next to it. It's still in the geo-fence. Um, but if I wanted to stop at a meeting or for dinner, I can lock the bike to itself, uh, have dinner, come out, but the meter's still running. So there's systems out there now, and we've, we've looked at all of them and confident there's a solution there. It's very complex to put it in, and the parking is a big part of it to make sure you've got it right. That's part of the distribution plan. Um, and we've taken a lot of learning there from other parts of the world, and certainly the UK, and obviously London. So that was two of your points as far as I can cover them. Uh, the advertising one, I think I might have skipped over one, I've forgotten what it was. That's being explored at the moment, the potential to get some revenue, certainly in the early days, to cover it. Um, so that is being actively explored at the moment, and it's the right time to do it before we've, uh, we've, we've got going. But there's also the potential to make that part of a larger B network offer. You know, whatever products are associated, be it signage, be it app. So that's being explored actively at the moment. What was the one I missed off? I got three out of four. Pulling off car journeys. Oh, as far as which mode shift? Well, the, the overriding target, and, and, and Nicola and Jonathan might come in on this, the, the, the better situated to do so. But their overall target is we've got to increase cycling and walking journeys by a million every day. Uh, the most important thing that we know from evidence says to do that is to give people safe space, and secondly is to give people a way to use it, particularly those who don't have ready access to, to their own bikes. And they're not going to be Boardman bikes now. Although I'd like word, that. I think the biggest word is sorry. I think the biggest word is integration. We, it's not just about taking somebody out of the car. It's try to educate people wherever you go. I say this on all opportunities now. Where, generally speaking, people get a bus from A to B, or a car from A to B, or a, a train. They, they don't think about integration as a whole, as that might include walking or cycling, to get onto that bus, to get to that point, to get off there, to get another bus or um, train, etc., to go where you're going. And I think that's the biggest selling point for us, or the hardest thing for us to educate. And this is where I raised with Andy about, um, you know, our youth council being a big part of that, to be honest, to get that message out, to see what younger people are saying, and get it into their vocabulary about the integration point of view, because they're our future. Angelique, you just want to come in on that same point. Chair, sure. can I just add one no. tiny point, just to add on to that? You, you mentioned getting people, what about if it takes people off buses and public transport? Well, it's not as good as getting them out of the car, but it's, it's, still, it's still a better result. It's still moving towards something that's even better. So it wouldn't be, it's not disastrous if they get off a bus and ride a bike instead. On, John. Yeah, uh, I, I was really interested to see whether or not any calculation had been made about what contribution it would make to the uh, modal shift. But actually, uh, if, it, if it stops people from walking and cycling instead, or stops people from using pub public transport and cycling instead, that is not necessarily a bad thing at all. Um, because if it then encourages those people to then start cycling in, in, and buying a bike, because there are plenty of people who might use it who've not cycled for years and years and years and then get the bug to get on a bike again. That is generally a good thing. Chair, could I just contribute on that? I think you're absolutely right. That, that is absolutely correct. That is one aspect that bike hire can introduce, which is this move to introduction to the mode. Um, there may be some abstraction, but at certain times, particularly at peak load on, on bus and tram networks, it can abstract uh, journeys from that which might actually help with conditions for other 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 users um, but what I was going to suggest simply is that obviously we're going to be bringing a series of papers to both this and the mayor's board and the other uh, relevant authorities so rather than go into any detail about what we suspect now I'm currently reviewing the commercial operational models with the team um, and what I hope to do is bring obviously some substantial information to this committee in due course chair. Thank you. I'm going to bring in Ryan and then move on quickly. Yeah. I'll keep it quick. Perhaps this should have been at the beginning. I don't know, because most are going, and I've got to go in a minute, a hospital appointment. But the most shocking thing I heard today was all meeting was more cyclists, if I got it right, are killed 
on the roads in Greater Manchester than homicides. And when you think of the mainstream news about homicides, day after day, certain death, but very little about cyclists. So I'm suggesting, perhaps somebody's doing this, we identify the reasons for each death, coroner's reports, press cuttings, whatever. Because I remember one in our town recently, not long back, an old man who cycled and he went in a pothole, went over, cracked his skull, took him to hospital and he died. And that caused a lot of outcry. And it meant we bought new machinery to repair potholes quickly because the council had to pay up thousands in compo. And um, it made us all, we're all going on about potholes, but it made everybody say, we've got to do more to repair potholes quickly. Now, if there's some other reason like that, perhaps if you can identify them, and perhaps you'll tell me you're doing this, we can look at trying to put money into solving these particular issues. Thank you. Uh, just to clarify, Chair, uh, I think the headline figure Chris talked about was fatalities overall by all road users. Cycling and walking, yeah. Um, but the other point to think about is that um, one of the issues about um, the situation we face with cycling is it's about the deterrent from perceived risk as well as actual. And so one of the things we will be looking at is the kind of application of the national intelligence model, which the police use, to look yeah. at actually what the risk in exposure is uh, and other issues around antisocial use of the road. Um, I am concerned from uh, work I've done before that we don't want to focus just on the worst case headlines because they don't always make best, uh, best examples of, 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 th of how you should change because actually we need to look at the broader picture about risk exposure as well as actual um, incidents that occur. Thanks, Chair. Thank Okay, thank you very much for that. I'm conscious of how many people's left and how many we need to make decisions in, in uh, Part B. So can we move item 12, exclusion of the press and public? Thank you.